morning, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. Welcome to South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee. Thank you. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm chair of this committee. Please can those present in the chamber note that everything on your desk, um, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point because the camera follows the microphone being switched on. So, councillors and officers, also please, you're requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. And those who are participating in the meeting via the live stream, please indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column. Please don't use the chat column for any other purpose. And uh, my vice chair here will be making sure that we've got all those who request to speak in order, as he always does it. Uh, make sure your device is fully charged and you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do otherwise. Um, please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices so that you don't interrupt proceedings. And please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn your microphone off immediately. Speak slowly and clearly, and please don't talk over or interrupt everyone. Please note, if we do need to vote on any item, we shall do so via the appliances, the microphones here. Only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second recommendations. So, committee members present in the chamber, and I invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Um, so, my name is Councillor Pippa Halings, Chair of the Planning Committee, and my Vice Chair? Councillor Henry Batchelor, Vice Chair of the Committee. Thank you. Councillor Claire Daunton? Um, yes, I'm uh, Claire Daunton, and one of the members for the Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you. Welcome. Councillor Jeff Harvey? Yes, I'm the member for Fulton Ward. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. Tumi Hawkins, uh, member for Caldicott Ward. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Deborah Roberts? Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for Foxton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams? Um, Heather Williams, and I represent Northern's Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Dr. Richard Williams? Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Triple Oak, and Field and Newton. Yeah, welcome. And Councillor Eileen Wilson. Um, morning. Um, Councillor Eileen Wilson, member for Cottingham and Brampton. Thank you very much. And we also have two officers in the chamber Chris Carter, delivery manager. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Thank you very much. And <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Reed, <laughs> our senior planning lawyer. Morning, Chair. Good morning, I think we just have to adjust that whenever you'd like to speak, uh, Mr. Reid. Thank you very much. Good. We'll go on to agenda item two, which will be apologies. And Ian, are you with us, Ian Senior? Hello, Ian. I, I am indeed. Please, I introduce indeed. Well. Ian, please introduce yourself as well, Ian. Please introduce yourself. Yes, Ian Senior. Um, notionally, Democratic yeah. Services Officer, but uh, Scrutiny and Governance Advisor. Yes. Apologies for today. We have apologies from Councillor Dr. Martin Carr and Councillor Judith Ripper. And a substitute, Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton, is here for Councillor Carr. Thank you very much. And I've just been informed also we've received a message from Councillor Peter Fain, who's unable to make the meeting today and sends his apologies too. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank, Ian. You. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move now on to agenda item three, declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest, members? Mm -hmm. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I'd like to declare non-pecuniary interest in item six, which I've discussed with one of the local members, but I come to the matter afresh. And also item nine, um, which... Um, refers to the ward I represent. I have also discussed that very briefly with the um, other local member, Councillor Goff, but uh, I come to the matter afresh. Thank you very much, Councillor Eileen Wilson. Could I just ask that both you and Councillor Jeff Harvey, that perhaps if you bring your microphones a bit closer, both of you are just a little quiet when I'm hearing you. Thank you. And um, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. At 
Council, uh, sorry, uh, I, item eight, which is the Thalmere one. Um, I'm a member of Thalmere Parish Council, um, but I come to this matter afresh. And at item nine, um, it's obviously to do, I think, with the uh, Smithy Pen Traveller site, so I won't uh, participate in that either. I will participate in the Thalmere one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, agenda item 14, I'm a local member for one of the cases that's um, refer referred to the easy for me to say on Wednesday morning. Thank you. And I don't know if it's me. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm either going deaf or I'm, you're very quiet there as well, Councillor. <laughs> you never normally accuse of being quiet, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to miss any of that. So I don't know. A, bit, a little bit louder, I'd perhaps bring the microphone a little bit closer to it. And uh, Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Agenda item number five. Uh, this is a historical relationship. I used to be the uh, member for Toft, um, not anymore. And I'm also familiar with the sister development on the adjacent site to this, which I've discussed before, but I'm coming to this fresh. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. That's no more. Very good, thank you. And now we go to agenda item number four, the minutes, which are in our report pack. Do we have any comments from the meetings? Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, page two, it says that uh, Council Dr. Richard Williams took part in the debate, but he didn't. He was the same as myself. He didn't take part. And then later on, um, there's a typo which is, should, says nor rather than not on page five on the number eight. Nor, where was that, sorry? If you look at the Harson application, the local plan did nor designate. Good, thank you very much. Any further, no, and um, I would just like to make one on page three, which is in the item five, which was on the water beach application um, and it said that the travel plan was commended as innovative and comprehensive and I think several of the members also commended the excellence in terms of the green standards and the energy efficiency and renewable generation so I think we should also have that minuted because these are the kind of standards of buildings that we would like to um, embrace and encourage so thank you very much no more comments on the minutes good Thank you very much, members. So we'll now move to the substantive items on the agenda, starting with agenda item five. This is application 20 slash 01992 slash full application for Toft, Bennell Farm, West Street, Toft. The proposal is for the erection of 41 dwellings, including two self-build plots and associated development. The applicant is Bennell Developments Limited. And for us, this will be repeated by the case officer, but our key material planning considerations that we will be looking to debate um, the balance around on this item is principle of development, housing and open space provision, character and appearance of the area and adjacent green belt, highway impacts and parking, residential amenity, flood risk and drainage, landscaping and trees, biodiversity, contamination, and the developer contributions. This is not a departure from application, and I'm confirming this is not a departure. Um, and the reason this has been brought to committee is to allow consideration of the local parish council objections. Our presenting officer is Richard Fitzjohn. Are you with us, Richard? Hello, Chair. Hello. We can see you clearly. That's very good. Thank you. And if you have any updates and a summary of um, of the application, um, just just as a matter of housekeeping, um, it's come to my attention that condition 19, um, which is recommended in the report, um, it references dwelling. Um, it should reference dwellings. So if members are minded to um, approve the application, I would just request that. that Condition 19 can be amended to say dwellings rather than dwelling. Just one moment, cast up Jimmy Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Looks like the only view that we have of Mr. Fitzjohn is in the back. Ah, there. Do you want to change seats? 
think I'm probably going to have to. One question to you, one below. Is that okay, Tommy? Or, or can you both screen to show me? Thank you. We can have both screens if that's fine. Thank you. You just just one moment, Richard. We perhaps could be pulling up your presentation if you want. Thank you. And for anybody viewing live stream, what we've just done is made sure that we have the screens available for and visible for everybody in the room, for the members in the room. So we now have that. Councillor Dr. Tony Hawkins, you can see. Is that okay? That's fine. Thank you very much for that support. Um, Richard, yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, could I just confirm that you can see my screen? Please? You can, yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, this is um, the application site is Benel Farm, West Street. Uh, in the parish of Toft, but within the development framework of Comberton. Um, so the application site is outlined in red on this plan. Uh, the blue line represents land ownership of the applicant surrounding that. Um, this slide shows um, an, an allocation site within the local plan. It's reference H1H. Um, the application site for this application comprises the um, western section of this site, just here. Um, so the west of this um, existed, the, the previous access road here, um, and the site to the east of that previous access road um, is under development um, for 90 dwellings at the moment, which forms the um, allocation within the local plan. You can see um, also on here that the uh, black dotted line around the site um, is the development framework, so the site is within the development framework. Um, and then the green represents green belt land, which surrounds the application site to the north, the south and the west, um, but doesn't include the application site. So uh, this is an aerial image. Um, it's a bit outdated now um, because of the progress of the site. Um, but it's the most recent one available. Um, but it's just to give you an idea of where the application site is. So the application site for this, this application is this section of land here. And this larger section of land is the site that's under construction for 90 dwellings at the moment. So the erection, uh, the application is for the erection of 41 dwellings, including two self-build plots and associated development. And the um, slide here shows the proposed layout of the site. So you can see um, the approved access comes in here for the um, development to the east for the 90 dwellings. It would serve um, also the proposed development of 41 dwellings here. Uh, there's a drainage basin down to the south of the site and some open space. Um, the, there are some apartment blocks um, also to the southern edge of the site, southern end of the site, sorry. Um, and then it's um, houses um, further north within the site. So this is a story height plan to show the proposed um, heights of the development. So um, you can see um, it's majority dwellings are sort of two, two and a half story. Um, flats are sort of really sort of two and a half, three story um, on the, this, this southern end here. Uh, this is uh, an example of um, the proposed elevations for one of the two bed house types. Um, I'll sort of flick through some of the, the house types so you get an idea of what they would look like.
to show some site sections. And then this is just some um, montages of um, sort of how, how the development would appear from the street that's been provided from, from the agent, um, sort of showing with the sort of the existing landscaping that's um, around the site at the moment, sort of how sort of visible it's likely to, to be. So the key considerations uh, in the determination of this application relate to the principle of development, housing and open space provision, character and appearance of the area and adjacent green belt, highway impacts and parking, residential amenity and impacts, flood risk and drainage, landscaping and trees, biodiversity, contamination and developer contributions. In respect to the principle of development, the site is located within the, the competent, competent development framework um, where policy S7 supports residential development in principle. You can see that again within the black dotted line here. The proposal is for 41 dwellings, which um, exceeds the indicative maximum scheme size of 30 dwellings, which is set out in policy S9 of the local plan. However, 30 dwellings is an indicative figure to indicate the upper limit of housing development likely to be suitable. Um, so, I mean, that, that is indicative. Um, the application site forms part of an allocated site for residential development. And given the context of the adjacent development, the proposed development of a greater number of dwellings than the indicative scheme size is justified through the design led approach. The location of the proposed, proposed development conflicts with site reference H1H of the local plan, which is the, the allocated site that I mentioned. However, this conflict with, with site reference H1H should be balanced against other local plan policies and material planning considerations. On balance, due to the application site being located within the development framework, the contributions in lieu being provided for the allocation site, and the compliance of the proposed development with policies S7 and S9 of the local plan, it's considered that the residential development of the site is acceptable. In terms of housing and open space provision, the um, proposed development would provide 16 affordable dwellings, which accords with policy H10 of the local plan. Um, it would be provided in a cluster of 16 units, um, which um, exceeds the cluster size, the maximum cluster size um, within the Greater Cambridge Housing Strategy uh, by one unit, which says um, maximum should be 15. However, uh, this conflict is considered to be very minor. Um, it's been discussed with the Affordable Homes Department of the Council, um, who um, uh, remain supportive of, of the scheme um, despite, despite that. Um, it's got acceptable informal open space provision and um, contributions um, in lieu would be provided for children's space, outdoor support and allotments and community orchards. Um, in accordance with the, the heads of terms um, document that's included in Appendix A of the report. In terms of the character and appearance of the area and the adjacent, the adjacent green belt, um, this just shows the um, some of the photos of the development that's under construction to the east of the site um, within the allocation site. Um, the proposed um, development would um, be of a similar character and appearance to the development that's sort of being built out at the moment. Um, and obviously accessed off the, the same sort of main access road into the site. Um, so it's going to appear as an extension to the, um, the larger development to the east. Um, by virtue of its location layout, access arrangements, scale and appearance, the proposed development will be viewed as an extension to that larger development um, and is consider considered to be in character with the area on that basis. The um, site's located within the development framework. It's adjacent to the existing larger development. Um, it responds appropriately to the local visual context. It is compatible with its location and would be appropriate in terms of scale density, mass, form, sizing and appearance. Uh, the application site is also located outside of adjacent to the Greenbelt. 
the proposed development provides a landscape buffer between the built form of the development and the green belt to the south of West Street. There's also a buffer between the application site and the green belt to the north, um, where there's existing commercial buildings to the north of the site. Um, there's also a substantial tree belt between the application site and green belt to the west, which would significantly screen the development from the green belt. Um, you can see the existing um, trees on the photo here. Um, there's also quite a lot of trees um, to the front of the site as well. Um, so the site is quite well screened. Um, additional landscaping can be secured by the planning condition if the planning condition was to be approved. In respect of highway impacts and parking, the local highway authority has no objections. Uh, the proposal includes adequate car and cycle parking. Um, there would be the provision of two new bus stop shelters and the provision of solar studs to the park between Fennel Farm and Toft. They're set out within um, the planning conditions. In respect to flood risk and drainage, the site is located within flood zone one. The application demonstrates that surface water from the proposed development, development can be managed through the use of permeable, permeable paving over private drive areas and will be attenuated in an, in an attenuation basin in the south of the site before discharge to the adjacent water course. The Lee Local Flood Authority have no objections subject to conditions. And the council's drainage officer has stated that the surface water drainage measures can be secured by planning condition. There is no objection from the Environment Agency or Anglian Water in respect of drainage. Uh, in respect to landscaping and trees, the majority of trees within or adjacent to the site would be retained. However, the support quality trees, which are to be felled um, more centrally within the site, and the council's tree officer has no objection to this. Council's landscape officer has considered that the layout of scale, self build plots, protection of existing vegetation, soft landscape specification, and boundary treatments are all acceptable. Uh, she did raise concerns about the, um, the one in three slopes of the attenuation basin, um, saying that it's too engineered and that the headwall detail should reflect the rural location and precast concrete series should be replaced with an alternative. Um, but she's confirmed that these details um, can be conditioned appropriately. In respect to developer contributions, um, there's a number of developer contributions included within the heads of terms, which are considered sufficient to mitigate the impacts of the proposed development. There's a full list of heads and terms, including details and projects, uh, which the financial contributions would go towards the set out within, in full in Appendix A of the committee report. Um, I just want to sort of flick back to the slide near the start. In terms of sort of covering developer contributions. So um, the site to the um, east, um, which forms the allocate, allocation site, um, where 90 dwellings were approved, um, that, that was first approved in 2015. Um, an outline application was. Um, as part of that 2015 outline application for the 90 dwellings, um, it um, included um, the area where the current application site is, um, was to be um, uh, used to provide football pitches, changing facilities and car parking. Um, in 2017, another outline application was submitted to the council and approved which um, removed um, the provision of the football pitches, um, parking and changing facilities from, from this section of the site um, and provided financial contributions in lieu. Um, those, that, that, that was all agreed. Um, those financial contributions um, were secured. Um, and the result of that was that basically this um, site for the current application is um, was to be retained as agricultural land, um, not not built on, um, but there were the financial contributions in lieu which were provided from that. Um, subsequently, um, the allocation of the site um, within the local plan, um, because this was all, all going to be an allocated site, obviously included um, this area of land with, within the development framework. Um, so it's now um, 
a, a piece of land within the development framework which um, is cur currently not, not built on. The uh, conclusion screen. Uh, sorry, uh, so uh, in terms of other matters, um, in terms of residential amenity, there's no significant impact on existing residential properties and the proposed dwellings would have a high quality of amenity. In terms of biodiversity, the impacts are considered acceptable subject to conditions. Um, contamination, the site has been assessed for contamination and there's no further investigation required. Um, and archaeology um, and evaluation was carried out previously and no further evaluation is required for that. So in conclusion, the proposed development would provide an additional 41 dwellings to the district's housing supply, including 16 affordable dwellings, all of which would be located within the development framework. The proposed development would reflect the character and appearance and density of the development of 90 dwellings immediately to the east, it would preserve the character and appearance of the area. There's no outstanding objections from technical consultees and subject to conditions. The proposed development would have acceptable impacts in respect to highways, parking, residential amenity, flood risk, drainage, landscaping of trees, biodiversity, and con contamination. In addition, the proposed development provides a number of financial contributions towards services and facilities in top, Compton and Toft, and having regard to applicable national policies and local policies. Um, officers recommend that planning permission uh, should be approved, subject to the completion of Section 106 in accordance with the heads of terms set out within Appendix A of the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, you. Um, thank you very much. And I, what we'll do is we'll take questions as part of the debate as we're going in to clarify the debate as we go forward rather than doing them separately now. And so I'll move forward to the public speaking part. And we have Ed Durrant with us in the chamber as the applicant. Mr. Durrant, you're with us. Thank you very much. Um, and you've got your microphone there, have you? Can you just test it so we see if you're visible when you speak? Can you hear me? Just, yes. can just hear you, yes. Oh, and we can see you now as well, which is a tiny part of that screen there on the team screen. Um, thank you very much. And Mr. Carter here to my left will help in terms of the timing of that. I think you're very well accustomed to the protocol in terms of the three minutes that you have. Um, so thank you very much, Ms. Durrant. The proposed development will deliver 41 new homes to the district, including 16 affordable homes and two self-build plots through the continuation of the successful development to the east of Fennell Farm. Accordingly, this application is supported by planning and housing officers as the site is in a sustainable location and the new homes will help maintain the council's five-year supply of housing. The development will complete the build-out of the land allocated through policy H1 for new homes. This allocation released the site from the Greenbelt and extended the development framework for Comberton. In accordance with policy H1, the proposed development delivers a design-led approach that continues the design themes of Fennell Farm East, which is already delivering market and affordable homes for the district. Combaton is one of the most sustainable rural settlements in the district, and the new homes will be within walking distance of schools, shops, and public transport. The layout and landscaping of the site has been designed so that the new homes are not visible in distant views from the Greenbelt. The new homes will be set back from West Road behind a generous landscaped buffer that will form part of the ecological enhancement of the site and provide amenity for new and existing residents. As part of the application process, we have engaged with Toft and Combaton Parish Council. The package of Section 106 contributions, including payments towards health, education and public transport, and planning conditions, will secure measures that ensure the new homes successfully integrate into the fabric and communities of the area. As a result of comments made by the parish councils and other statutory consultees, the application has been amended to reduce the number of dwellings and provide more space for new planting and green space. The reduction in building heights and additional landscaping will also further limit views of the development from the approach in Combaton. There are no outstanding objections from technical consultees as the proposed measures to provide water attenuation within the site, promote public transport, and enhance the ecological value of the site are all acceptable. 
We welcome the opportunity for members to endorse the recommendation of your professional offices and enable the delivery of 41 new homes to the district, including 16 affordable homes and two self-build blocks in this sustainable location. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members, do we have any questions for Mr. Durant? Councillor Dr. Kim Wilkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Ed. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the inclusion of two self-build blocks. Where exactly are these self-build blocks? They are quite centrally located on, on the western side of the, the site. So um, I don't know whether if Richard could perhaps bring up a plan, but um, they are functionally... Yeah, I'll, I'll try to plan to show it. So essentially you have apartments to the south and then as it kind of moves further north the heights decrease and you've got dwelling houses and the two self-built plots are just where Richard is indicating See. there. Great, great plots here. Second question if I may, um, on page 25 we have a statement that says that there will be significant impact on the healthcare provision which if unmitigated will be unsustainable. Now, I know there is a contribution towards um, provision of healthcare. My question is, where is this provision going to be? In Cumberton or elsewhere? Because there is no space to expand in the current um, surgery. In fact, the table shows there's spare capacity at negative 148.8. 11 square meters. I mean, the, the spending of Section 106 contributions is very much down to, to the NHS, and, and we, as on behalf of the applicant, couldn't possibly kind of give a response on their behalf. But clearly, that is the, the money that they requested from the application to mitigate the impacts, and, and that money will be secured through the Section 106. I will come to that in the debate, if I may, Chair, because we've discussed this when the 90 was also done, and still nothing has been done. There is no space, there's nothing that's been allocated. Sorry, thank you, yes. Mr. Hawkins. We'll wait for the debate. Thank you. Councillor Heather O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. I'm sure yourself, um, you mentioned the advice of, of professionals, but ultimately, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Durant will understand that it's the democratic process that will decide this. And uh, so the, the affordable housing in one particular area. Can I just understand from the applicant the um, decision-making process that they've made to do that? Because although he says there's no um, objection, obviously 40% from the affordable housing, it does say that small clusters would be preferred from our housing offices. So can you explain the um, thought process behind why they want to put all the affordable housing in one corner? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, it's essentially a large part of the um, provision of affordable housing is through the apartment blocks, and that was at the request of South Cams. So it's worth noting that South Cams housing also has the affordable housing on the eastern side, which is all located to the south of the site. And obviously where you have apartment blocks, it's difficult to have mixed tenures. So, so part of the reason to uh, deliver all of the affordable housing is the fact that they're coming forward at the request of the housing offices as smaller dwelling units as apartments. Thanks, Chair. Can I just, just come back to something you said? So you said that on the other site, you've also put all the affordable housing in one place. I don't think it's possible to bring that up to see, because obviously we've got two applications on one site overall. Um, but are you, are you suggesting then that you've had different advice to what's in our report, where they say they would have preferred small clusters? So the original application does there is some breaking up of the affordable housing, but the majority of it, again, is delivered through apartments. And again, the fact that you can't have the mixing of tenures or most local um, or registered providers don't want to take on housing where you've got mixed tenures within apartment blocks. The majority of the affordable housing for, for Nail Farm East is accommodated in the apartments to the, to the south of the site in the same way that it will be accommodated on Nail Farm West. Thank you, Chair. 
you say about the apartments, and I can understand why you're saying that, but there is other thing that's other affordable housing outside the apartments why are they allocated so closely why is it all together i don't feel i'm getting my question sure. answered um, in terms of a cluster there is an element of gray area about that because the the affordable dwellings that are being provided or affordable houses in addition to the affordable apartments are actually accommodated the other side of the the access road into the site so they are, there is a form of, of physical separation, and obviously there will be a mixture of tenures. The, the, the kind of further separation of them, I think from a, a kind of management point of view, most of the registered providers we deal with, although they recognise the, the kind of desire for clustering or, or kind of not to have too large a cluster, they generally, from a management point of view, prefer them to be as close to, to each other as possible. I mean, in this instance, we are only one dwelling over the cluster, and we are providing apartments where we can't mix the tenures and a pair of semi-detached houses. So it would be very difficult for us to provide that one single dwelling that, that then wasn't in a cluster. I think it would, for, for the, the kind of conflict of only one dwelling over the, the cluster, it's, it's a very minor conflict with, with the policy of the Labour plan. I think we can just take the rest of the debate, I think, because that's what you've got to say. Yeah. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was wondering about the, this was um, originally designated as recreation and green space, and now it's, um, the application is for 40 plus homes. Um, has other land been earmarked to replace that green space that's being lost? Because now we have um, a full of 90 homes with um, a green space we it now looks like we're going to have 130 homes with no recreational space so could you just explain where the recreational space for all those homes will be so obviously the, the history of the application site is that the application that was first approved by the council included the recreational space in accordance with the, the emerging policy at the time however it turns out that neither parish council wanted to take on that space. So at the request of the council, another outline application was submitted, which dealt with the requirement for open space by way of a section 106 contribution to provide enhancements for combatant and top, so public space and sports facilities in combatant and top. All of this went through before the local plan was adopted. So whilst Richard mentioned that there was a a conflict with policy H1 slash H. That conflict was already carried out at the request of the, the district council when the application was submitted to essentially to remove the, the public open space from the development. That went through the application process, it came before members of the planning committee and it was approved on that basis. Um, yes. Um, Richard, the case officer, I think we can see your screen as you're scrolling through. Um, you're, you're probably looking for something that's helpful or you think it's going to be requested, but we're, we're watching your thought process <laughs> as you're looking for the document. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, not sharing the screen. So thank you, Councillor. I think that's going to be a key point within the debate, Councillor Wilson. So is that fine? You've answered the question there. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Dr. Claire Donton. Thank you. Um, just going back to the apartment blocks, um, could you just confirm, um, Mr. Durrant, that they're at the entrance to the site? Yes, they are indeed. They're to the, the southwest corner of the site. Site, that's the first thing that one will see, the apartment block. Yes, and, and it's, it's essentially it's the part of the site where you've already got some, some quite significant mature trees that, that block the view from, from westward, as the CGIs that, that Richard put up show. Also, could you uh, please confirm that all the dwellings conform to national space standards? They do indeed, yeah. As part of the last amendment, we ensured that they all are, meet national space standards. And all, also all, they, all yeah. I've heard you correctly, all. They do indeed, and also at the request of the urban design officers, we include balconies within the apartment blocks, which is, funnily enough, something that wasn't included in Bunnell Farm East, um, but as it was a specific request of urban design, the scheme was amended to include balconies for the apartment blocks. Thank you. 
Councillor Eileen Wilson, another question. Thank you. I just, I just have another question. I note in paragraph 26 of the report that the surface water from the proposed development can be managed through the use of permeable paving over private drive areas. Um, does, would this requirement exist in perpetuity? Um, would, would people have to go through a planning application to change those drives? Because as we know, surface water is, we've had lots of flooding because of surface water where on places that aren't um, liable to flood. So I would just like to know um, whether this will be permanent, the permeable paving. Do you want me to respond? I mean, if, if the council believes that it is an issue that needs to be addressed, then it can certainly attach a condition to require that no changes be made to, to the permeable paving or to the driveway details of all the dwellings. But it's worth noting the site essentially looks after itself in terms of water attenuation. It's got a large attenuation feature as part of the amenity space to the south. So during heavy rain events, the water within the site will be retained. Um, and whilst there have been objections raised by the local parish councillors and, and neighbours about flooding, this development will essentially form a, a sense of betterment in the, that it will retain water within the site, within the, the infrastructure within the site during heavy rain events and only release it at a greenfield rate. So it will not, it will not increase existing flooding issues within the village. Thank you very much, and Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chairman, through you. Um, good morning, Mr. Laurent. Um, I'm going to take up the concerns of the parish council that are written down, and it's a concern of mine as well. Given the fact that this was um, green belt, and uh, there is a description within the parish council's uh, input of a gentle uh, move um, into the village and that this uh, site is important in that aspect. Can you please explain to me how you have totally ignored the um, number 30 um, that should be um, the, the most we should expect here. Um, why this very large percentage uh, increase has been put forward? Thank you, Chair. Obviously, the application has been put forward with support of planning officers, and we went through the pre-application pre process, at which they pre-proposed 50 dwellings, and officers were supportive of that. As a result of the detailed design, this number has come down to 41 dwellings. But essentially, the, the number that we're, we're looking at is policy H1 slash H, which says that it is a, an indicative capacity for the site, that the development of the site will be led by a design-led approach, essentially. When the council allocated this site, it accepted an urbanisation of the land, whether that urbanisation was through the introduction of sports pitches and associated development or through houses, the council accepted that. The outline applications that went through, both went through before the local plan was adopted and the reserve matters for the site was also approved shortly after the local plan was adopted. At no point did the council seek to modify the allocation through the local plan process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no further questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Laurent. And now I understand that Chris Carter has a statement from the parish council that we can see there. I'm sorry, I missed that. Sorry, thank you. Thank if you, if it's to do with drainage, perhaps we could ask it of the odd case officer. Just one little clarification from the applicant that was being asked for. Um, it's para the, the last paragraph in paragraph 21, um, which says that the, there is increased, I'm sorry, pluvial flood risk to the site, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, there'd have to be a lot more work done to establish the finished floor level of the proposed dwellings to protect future occupants from flooding. I just wanted to ask if the applicant has actually done any of that work yet and can tell us if the floor levels will indeed prevent flooding. 
I mean, the area of the site we're talking about in particular is the southern part of the site. The, um, our clients, drainage consultants, have looked after it, looked at that in response to the um, Compton Fee response from the drainage officer, and they are confident that there will no, not be a need for any significant raising of um, floor height, and this can be dealt with by condition. We've discussed this with the case officer and the drainage officer, and they're both content for this matter to be dealt with by condition. If I may, so the, the work hasn't been done yet? Yes they've, or no? They've looked at it and they're, they're confident that it's, it will not be needed. But I mean, the detailed design stage in terms of some of the necessary drawings for building regulations, etc., will not only be, will be carried out once the planning commission has been granted. So they haven't. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and so now we'll hear. We have one more question, Mr. Rand, I think, yes. Back to Ed Williams. Thank you, Chair. It was just um, as a sort of follow-up to Councillor Dr. Tony Hawkins' question, if you may, Doc. Did he say that the potential drainage issues are in the south of the site, so where the affordable housing is? There is an area that, that kind of extends into the south, but it's mainly the water attenuation feature. The water attenuation feature, which will be constructed, is essentially being there, um, will be constructed to protect all of the dwellings in the site and all of the statutory contentees, including the lead local flood authority and environment agency are confident that that will be the case. Thank you. Good, um, and now we'll hear from the statement from the parish council. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, the statement reads as follows. Unfortunately, Toft Parish Council is not able to provide representation at today's meeting, but it wishes to emphasize some of the points made in its original response and to urge the committee to reject the proposal. The proposal is not in the approved local plan and the number of houses exceeds that designated for a minor rural centre. Having spent so much time and effort on the local plan, it would seem difficult to justify not complying with it. The original proposal was to use the location for recreational space, which Toft Parish Council would support, and this would provide a break between the adjacent harsh agricultural greenbelt and Anne Village. That's it. Thank you very much to um, Top Parish Council and for the comments that they've made throughout the process. Um, local member, would you like to speak? No, you're not the local member anymore. Right, okay. Members, we will now move to the debate. Councillor Tony Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to sound like a very grumpy old woman here, um, but I think I'm well within my rights to do that. I think the last point that was made by the Toft Parish Council was quite right. Um, I have seen the proposals for this site go from, oh, 60 maximum, landscape-led, to up to 90, and definitely 90, and now we're going up to 131. This just is not right. The local plan policy states up to 90 on the east side, not the west side of the access road on that side. And there is a conflict there, but there's also a conflict in the fact that the number being proposed is much higher than the 30 that it should be for. I think it's a minor rural center is um, cumbersome. So for me, the principle of, um, uh, of, of the development um, definitely is, there's a conflict there. And in some ways, this, this, this whole thing is, uh, is, it's unintended consequence, perhaps, of the, the request for a provision of something that wasn't really supported by both Combertin and Toft, went into the plan, then taken out of the plan, and rather than actually firming up what we should do with that bit, that was left undone in some respect, but really should be for recreation, not for housing. That, you know, when, when we say to communities, oh, you know, we will make sure that that gets done or this gets done, we don't do it, this is what happens. Housing, I mean, clustering, we, we want to see uh, what we call tenure-blind affordable housing, by putting them in blocks of flats 
in the front of the side. How tenure blind is that? None whatsoever. We all know that's where the affordable housing is. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's completely in conflict with our policy. So please don't tell me that we asked for it. No, we wanted tenure blind. Um, and we're now going into this situation where we're, being, we're providing affordable housing in blocks of flats. Excuse me, where are our terraces? Right? Why do they have to be in blocks of flats? And in any event, what's the ridge height of those blocks of flats? We're saying, oh, two and a half stroke three. Excuse me, it's a village. Right? You're coming into this village, you've got the green belt as you come in, and the first thing you see are, you know, two and a half, three-story blocks of flats. I'm sorry, it's wrong for the character of the area, and not near the green belt either. And it does not respond to the local visual context. It certainly does not. Flood risk. I ask that question specifically, because that area is subject to, uh, what do you call it? Surface water, <laughs> right? Water sits there. And it's important that when developers come to us, you don't leave lots of things to be done, discharged by conditions. We have way too many conditions. And when those conditions come, we, you know, the, the, the process of discharging those is not the same as actually when you're able to look through all of this information right up front. You complain there's too many conditions, but you don't do the work that gives us the information we need to actually make the decision. Please, Th there is a significant flood risk here, and we need to make sure that that is, that is dealt with. You're going to cut down trees. What happened to the landscape-led design? How many trees are going to be cut down on this side? You already have cut down trees on the other side. And the trees that are being cut down, what's going to replace them? How long is that going to take? There's no biodiversity net gain at all in here. None whatsoever. And all the houses will be car dominated. The front ridges will be car dominated. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have all the pages here, but I could go back and give you the page numbers. It's going to be car dominated. And healthcare provision. Let me get back to that. I know for a fact that the proposal to mitigate the, uh, the affordable, uh, sorry, the, the healthcare is not going to be incumbent in itself. There is current, there's no land allocated for a new uh, surgery. The one that's there now is completely full. Even people from Codicott use it. I know that. You know, it caters for a lot of the surrounding area. The only thing, the only place where they can do this is, I think it was Little Eversden, where they were going to expand that. How do people get to Little Eversden from, <laughs> from Combertin, for goodness sake? And instead of actually helping us, Making land available on this plot of land, you're proposing to build houses on it, all of it. The statement was that it would be an un unmit you know, if unmitigated, would be severe impact on the community. I'm sorry, guys, but we, we, we must make sure that the provision is good. I'll leave that. There's, there's, there's plenty. I'm sorry, I'm being very grumpy here, but I am not at all happy with this development, at all. This, this is a debate here amongst ourselves rather than directed to the applicant, Councillor Dr. Kim Hawkins. But what I have heard and what we are trying to do is make sure that this, this debate is around this balance. So the balance has to say, in terms it's saying that the principle is acceptable, but we have to look at what the harm is to that. And do we balance the benefits versus the harm? What I've heard in terms of reasons for concern there are scale, principle of development in itself because of the conflict, uh, in your opinion, is, is greater um, in terms of the harm. The affordable housing in terms of it not being um, policy compliant because of tenure blind, although it's been seen as acceptable, um, but with concerns by affordable housing. Character, appearance, the green belt, and the flood risk in terms of not bringing the information, um, leaving it to condition rather than having sufficient information here to um, understand what we're doing for under flood risk, the trees and biodiversity, and the section 106 mitigation impacts. Those are the material considerations that you've brought here. So as we go into the debate, we'll try not to sort of get repetition, but see if we, there are further reasons for that or additional details to that, or where you don't agree, perhaps, and you think there's more debate needed on some of those issues. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins has <laughs> dealt with all of the points um, I was going to deal with, and actually she's answered a few of the questions uh, that I had about where the, where the, where the extra um, capacity for the NHS would, would, would possibly come from. Um, so, so I think that that, that question has, has actually been answered. Um, I, I have I have the same concerns, um, uh, so I won't labour the point, and I won't I won't speak for very long. Um, I, I will say one thing though: it does concern me that at the suggestion that 50 houses um, were suggested here, and that was not seen as problematic. I, it, it, it does get to the point where I wonder why we've got these policies. Um, if if um, you know proposals are put forward that, that exceed them by, by huge margins, and this is not seen as problematic, it does. It does make me wonder why we've got the policies in the first place, but I do think the policies need to be adhered to, and I don't see um, a case for departing from uh, that policy in particular in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for recognising that we've had points about that. That's good. Thank you, Councillor. And it doesn't reduce your arguments at all or weaken them. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I was very glad to hear Councillor Hawkins very passionate. Um, discussion and debate about it. Um, I think she's absolutely correct. Um, for a change, Tumi and I are on the same side here, I think. Um, mark it down. We'll have cake later, Tumi. Um, what worries me about it is, is the fact that it's so against policy. And as uh, Councillor Richard Williams has just said, what do we have policies for if we are not going to keep with them? Clearly, because of its placement and next to the green belt, and a gentle approach into the village, um, the, uh, the numbers are an abortion, really. Um, to put 41 there um, against the uh, 90 already happening is, is just unbelievably bad. Um, and I really think we must start as a, an authority um, really sticking to uh, digging our heels in and stop allowing developers to try to get away with murder. Um, the thought of the three-story houses, the thought of the poor people all being stamped together in apartments um, at the front of the site um, in, in the manner that it has been, and then to be told, well, it's only one more, um, I think is an affront to our, our intelligence. Um, and so I shall definitely be voting against it. Uh, they. Uh, may go back to the drawing board, but um, it's time that we stop negotiating with them and actually told them the, what, what they will be, may be allowed to, to do, but not what they will be allowed to get away with. Thank you. Thank you. So what I've heard is, and as well with Dr. Richard Williams, is both in terms of the scale, um, there is the affordable housing, both in terms of section 106 as well, and character and appearance of... Which is the character appearance and scale on that one, which was 2.5. I think um, Chris Carter is asking to speak, and I do think, members, what we need to do as well is make sure that we're looking at the report. So when we say this is not compliant with policy, we've got to be very, very careful what we're saying as well. So if, if Chris wants to, I think it's the balance around how much harm is being done in terms of the, the policy, yes, Chris. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of points, uh, if I may. So policy S9, minor rural centres, which includes this. Um, uh, comment with regard to scheme size of 30 dwellings being permitted. Um, the supporting text to that policy does uh, go on to state that sites for new housing development have been identified as extensions to, uh, amongst other villages, Homberton, um, and the development frameworks have been drawn to include those sites. The indicative scheme size does not apply to allocations forming part of the overall development strategy of the local plan. So um, whilst I hear what, what members say, it's important to, to bear that in mind um, if members are thinking of any reason for refusal, that actually the policy does say that the 30 limit doesn't apply to sites that are allocated in the local plan. Just wanted to also comment on um, the healthcare provision, and whilst I clearly don't have the local knowledge and the history that others do, um, the, the, uh, the health bodies are responsible for delivering healthcare locally. Um, they seek contributions from uh, housing and other applications. Um, and this development is providing the contribution requested. Um, how that contribution is spent is a matter for presumably the clinical commissioning group, um, whether that means remodeling existing surgeries if, they're not, if not possible to extend them to increase capacity, I don't know, but I think I would caution against um, um, any 
user to a user that went down that line because the applicant is providing what the CCG is asking for in terms of financial contribution in this case. I think our ire should perhaps be directed at the health authority for how they're then going to spend that money and deliver the improvements that obviously members and, and the local communities want to see. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. On the basis of that, what, what I'm doing is saying that we are still looking at scale. What we're not saying is that it's not compliant with, um, you know, fully non-compliant with policy S9. But one of the reasons, if there were a refusal, is the, the, the scale of that in which it's being interpreted, if, if everyone's in agreement with that. Um, Councillor Dr. Timmy Collins, you wanted to come back on that point because I have got other people in the list, but did you want to respond in any way? I do. Um, I'm sorry, but I think we, we probably are being negligent here. If the um, uh, healthcare authority is asking for contributions, we ought to know how they intend to spend that contribution and where they're going to make that provision. I think it's our duty to, because we can't just leave it to them, and it will take years for them to do anything. We know that. And I know that there's no space at all in Competent for... But I think you've, you've made your point on that one. I'm sorry. We have to, well, when we're going, so what is, we have to do is we have to sort of see what's within our mandate. We're hearing that. And I think what you're talking about is placemaking and making sure that the mitigation of impact is real. Yeah. Mr. Park, would you like to... Um, I mean, uh, all, all I would add is that in the head returns, which is appended to the report, um, it does specify the project on which the money would be spent as either an extension or re of, of remodelling, or sorry, or remodelling the internal layout of Concord GP surgery. So that's the project that's been put forward by the NHS um, to the council to be included in the head return. Council Dr. Tumi Lodge, well, we, we can't have allegations. <laughs> Like that. But what we do know is a local reality, and we do know about the pressure on this, this kind of impact on local communities, and that's what's being discussed here. So I'm still keeping it in terms of the mitigation of impact. We're still concerned about the way these local impacts are being mitigated as one of the reasons. Next we have Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to draw uh, members' attention to our story height layout plan. Um, I don't know if it's been displayed. Richard, could you I'm put up the, the layout plan, please? Um, and I just want to get some clarification around we've got we've got single story, two story, two and a half story. Three story has been referred to, but it doesn't have a colour, nor actually are the apartment blocks, you know, so do can we have some sort so, of as I, as I understand officers. yes, can we have so Richard, so as I'd understood, and I also heard from the applicant, that there had been amendments based on comments about the size of the, of the buildings. Richard, could you give some clarification on that now? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, so, yeah, so this is the um, story height layout plan. Um, I can sort of run through the elevations again. So uh, these are the, the elevations that are the most, the most recent ones that have been agreed with consultees. So, um, sorry, Richard, just one moment. I may be misdirecting us. I'm sorry if I am, perhaps I've been. My, my point isn't about the elevations and things like that. On that story height layout plan, can I have confirmation that those in blue are the two and a half and then the orange, and I'll say single story yellow, there's no mention of three story on there, yet it's been referred to by new the applicant and the case officer. Yeah, um, if I just go to the elevations of the flats, um, so it's so it's these that are referred to as two and a half. Um, so you can see they've got the um, upper floor within within the roof up here. Um, so just but, just one, just one I mean, moment. Richard, it, 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 Richard, just one moment, sorry. What we have to clarify, and, and we've seen many examples of these <clears throat> where it often seems like common sense that that's three stories, but we know that is referred to as two and a half stories if it's within the house, if it's within the roof. Can we go back to the, so this is two and a half, and what Councillor Heather Williams is asking is to see where those two and a half are in the layout plan. Is there anything else that resembles three stories in any of these buildings, Richard? No, so, so where, where, where probably I wrongly refer to three story um, is, is, is where I'm referring to these which, you know, can, can sometimes be referred to as two and a half, sometimes three. Thank you. So can we go back to the layout plan, please, Richard? Yeah. Can you show us where those two and a half that you're talking, the two and a half, maybe three, are in the development? 
in the plot? Yeah, so so the, so there's the flats at the bottom here, mm -hmm. the blue, so the blue ones here, um, and then there's houses further to the north. Just bear with me. Oh, sorry, I didn't um, list them ones out. I was just wondering if you can see. There are there are there are some um, single dwellings um, with. Oh, sorry. Do, you, do, you, do, you, do you want me to just um, quickly find some elevations? I think if we just go back to the to the layout plan. I think we were just what yeah. mainly what it was 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 the clarification of what we're talking about, whether it's two point five or three, and where those are within the plot. That that's the question really. So we know that they're at the front part of the plot there. And there's a couple of the single dwellings maybe at the back. That's what we're hearing at the moment. That yeah, so it's all, the blue, it's all the blue ones. Councillor yeah. Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry that my clarification got so complex. Um, so, so I have a, a few points on, on this, and I'm trying to make sure it's not been already said, but there's been a lot said, so I might duplicate, Chair. Apologies. Um, but... This is a 37% increase on the indicative. So I, I understand what's been advised to us, that you know it's not 30 in concrete, so if it was 31, 32, anything like that. But 37% over the indicative, um, I think we're, and looking at the amount of space that's been taken up, I think we are looking at overdevelopment of this site. I am very worried about what's been referenced in relation to the drainage and not raising the floors in the southern area. But I do understand that that's a technical um, objection, which is very difficult to, to advise. On the affordable housing, I do think it's, while the affordable housing officers have supported it in the 40%, they do make reference to that they're, it's not what they would prefer. Now, so I think it's a bit disingenuous to say that they support it. In fact, I think it's completely disingenuous. Um, and this isn't just, the, the affordable housing isn't just apartments. There are other means as well. Uh, we have actually got mixed tenure in there in that we've got rented and shared ownership, which can be sold on the, on the open market. You know, there's absolutely no reason why this couldn't be dispersed to the northern, perhaps less drainage affected areas. We... Part of our policy says about distribution through the size, small clusters, but we have to look at small clusters in, in the context of the whole development. 16 properties out of 41 actually is a very, very large proportion. So although we have this, this 15 cutoff, it's not a case of the extra one. It's a case of that being essentially a third of, well, probably less than a third of the site being affordable housing, it's what it's 40%, and that's all in one patch, with the exception of one little house that's slightly further up. It's not dispersed through the site, it's not tenure blind, it's not anything that we should be standing for as a council. And I've also one one other matter of clarification. It refers to the pre-application. Now my understanding is that that um, while we obviously have professional advice as referred to by the applicant, that we are the decision makers as the committee and therefore not bound by any recommendation or actually any pre-application advice given. So um, I'm not quite sure why that was included, Chair. Some, some but thoughts I'd, around that would be much appreciated. But I'm, I'm sorry, it's not policy compliant. I think the significant harm to the, to the future residents, particularly in that, that affordable housing um, area, and I think it's overdevelopment site, and it's harm to the character of the entrance, given that there's going to be two and a half, if you want to be technical, straight whack bam in your face as soon as you walk through the village. That's a nice soft approach to the green belt, isn't it? Not. Thank you. Um, in terms of the pre-application, and it is something that we've 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 asked for, in that I think we do need to get to a better understanding of if applicants, you know, not all applicants, you know, applicants are applicants. They're putting forward a planning permission. So if they've had pre-application advice, that means they've wanted to be compliant and they've gone through a pre-application process. 
I think it's good for us to know it, but it doesn't bind us to anything. But we have asked, you know, I think it's quite good to know if it's gone to the design panel, if it's been pre-application, because I think we need to get a better understanding of uh, if all these things are actually pointing in the right way and shaping, being shaped by the policies we have. So, but it's not binding. I don't know, Chris, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, you're correct, Chair, it's not binding. Um, I'll just draw a distinction between um, technical officer advice and matters of planning judgment. The courts have held that um, in cases where councils have gone against technical advice, so that may be drainage or highways, without sufficient evidence to demonstrate the contrary, then um, that's, council, it's been found against councils in those circumstances. Clearly, there are matters here that are matters of planning judgment to do with design, scale, layout, and the like, which are obviously fully within the purview of the committee. Thank you. Good, thank you. Um, yes, and, and I've asked to speak, and I do think what I'd like to see is this, you know, this discussion around the balance. And so if our affordable housing officers, and I've been reading this, so they're saying, and they've given us the details, and I think this is one of the most detailed reports, which is, is a good one, I think, as well, that says they still think it's acceptable because there's a need, and there's quite a high level of need for affordable housing in the villages. So I suppose what they're saying is, that's still a need and this could help address the need. Our judgment is, but is that being provided in the right way? And what I'm hearing, and I agree with others, is I don't think it is being provided in the right way. Because if the affordable officer still says, we would have preferred something, we're hearing you know, what's being said there. Um, I'd like to bring up a new issue that's, I think, been slightly alluded to, but not in terms of a, you know, one of the material reasons. And that is the open space provision. So when we're looking at scale and density, and it's been referred to as overdevelopment of an area, and when we've seen within the report that there is a deficit of informal and open space, and especially as we know during the pandemic, how much more important and valuable that has become to everybody. So we are more highly alert to this and aware of it. Um, and I think knowing that now, so, we have to be very, very sensitive to that, and therefore we have to say so. If it isn't possible for on-site provision, there is the possibility to provide financial contributions in you. That again is a matter of judgment, and and in terms of, for me, my balance in terms of that is there is more harm into a highly, you know, so what are we saying is a greater density than 30. We accept that it can be, but in a higher density area, to not have either the on-site nor an area where that off-site is. It's just, it's going into formal space, really, um, in, in, in the other areas. And I heard the applicant say, you know, this was a decision made. We've got a planning history here between 2015, 2017, before the local plan was adopted, when a decision was made to receive financial contributions in lieu of providing decision by the parish councils, they didn't want to take on the management of that site. So it was left as an agricultural field. An agricultural field can provide access to walking, to habitat, to green space provision, even though it's an agricultural field. And there can be areas, you know, habitats around it. So I feel that the in terms, for me, there is harm there that isn't justified um, because it doesn't give enough provision on site to balance out that density. So that would be you know, one of my concerns. Secondly, in terms of the, I'd just like to support the issues around the flood risk. We now know, given we have just had the latest IPCC report, we do need to be more aware of um, potential flood risk. The report says that there is concern. We have had applications where the um, local flood authority and drainage officers have said, do the hydraulic modeling first so that we can know what kind of conditions are necessary. And they've done it before coming to planning committee so that we have all the evidence we need here. So I would just like to support Councillor Dr. Tony Hawkins' um, point there. Those are my points. And, but I do think we're looking at this, this balance again, you know, and um, so I, yeah, that's my point. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Jeff, Jeff Harvey. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Anyway, um, I, uh, well, two points. Um, firstly, you know, as, as an engineer, I, I just am quite troubled by this. We have a limit size of 15 um, for cluster size. And, and then we say, 
total 16 is only one more than the maximum that we decided. But, you know, really, the maximum is there to be the exception. In other words, we should be thinking more the cluster size is 12, but if there's a compelling reason to go to 15, then you can, because this really is saying, well, 15 wasn't the maximum, and now de facto 16 is the maximum. So I, and that's sort of um, symbolic of a lot of the other aspects of this case. But also, I mean, I would um, very much agree with uh, what the chair has just said. And, and I, I, slight, I was quite troubled with the um, uh, representative for the developer, sort of kind of implying that it was the parish councils, uh, it was on the parish council having um, declined to maintain what would have been a green space that, that, that now, I mean, there's no obligation on the land uh, owner um, that there is a third option, which is not to develop this green space, and then it would be um, just some farmland again. That's all I've got to say. Thank you, and Council Dr. Williams. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to come back to this point about S9, and I'm, I'm sorry to be a bit of a lawyer about it, but... Um, I, I, I take what was said earlier about the, the reference, and I think it's paragraph 2.61, um, which says that this 30 limit won't apply to allocated sites. But the allocated site action in this case is very clear. So the allocated site is to the east, not to the west. Um, and the officer's report, paragraph 43, does not make the case that S9 doesn't apply. It, it, it accepts, I think, S9 applies, and then it says that it, the departure is justified by a de design led approach. Um, so I did just want to make that point that I, I, I don't actually, from my mind, looking at the construction of H1H and S9, think that S9 doesn't apply. I think S9 does apply because S9 is not actually quite explicitly the site, um, sorry, the, the western side is quite explicitly not the site um, that the uh, local plan allocates for development. It, it's the eastern part, not the western part. Sorry if I've got my east and west mixed up there, but I think you probably know what I mean. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just dyslexia. Um, Hits, um, but um, but yes. Um, so I do, I just would like to pick that point up that I don't think it's clear that S nine doesn't apply here. I think we, we have said that we it, it's what we're saying is it's not totally policy non-compliant. It's the interpretation of that one. And as you said in the officer report, again they have you know identified the issues that you've you've been laying out there. Good. Um, we have one more person who member who is down to speak, which is Councillor Eileen Wilson. I haven't heard anybody who is bringing forward any sort of debate or differences of opinion there. And so if not, then I think we would, we would move to a vote on this, previously having a look at what the reasons for um, refusal would be if we were to refuse this. Um, so I, Councillor Eileen, are you bringing something new that would, no, thank you very much. So Chris, would you hold, oh, yeah? Yes. Okay. Yep. So we'll have an adjournment for 10 minutes. Um, it's 20 past 11, which is usually when we have a bit of a break anyway. So what I'll do is for 15 minutes, have a 15 minute break and we'll come back in again.
Thank you and welcome back to South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. We've just had a slight adjournment for recess for refreshments and also to bring together um, any of the arguments and justifications for the decision that we're about to take. And I've recommended that we move to a vote. <laughs> Councillor Garvey, um, can you turn your microphone and video off, please? We're very pleased that you've managed to connect. Thank you. Um, so I, I recommended that we move to a vote on this and so what we'd like to hear from now with the support of the officers is what would be any reasons for refusal. Yep, thank you Chair. So I've drafted a reason here uh, and was, as always final wording to be agreed with Chair and Vice Chair and we'll be um, happy with that. But um, by virtue of the height, scale, mass and siting of buildings in the southern part of the site and the lack of high quality and accessible open space, proposal is not considered to be compatible with the village edge location and would fail to preserve or enhance the character of the rural area contrary to policy HQ1. So we have all of the issues there would be about the mass, the scale, the height, the um, character appearance and the um, open space that would be within that. Are we, is that, are we okay with that as the, as the reasons for refusal if we were to vote as refusal members? I know that we had two other issues. So we had another issue was around flooding. What, um, so it's, these are clear reasons that we would be able to justify if, um, if this went to an appeal. The, the, the flooding, it's about, you know, again, a judgment about whether or not what information comes out because none of the technical statutory consultees have said anything about the flooding. And, and again, we also mentioned about the affordable. Um, and again, it's that, that balance. These are clear cut reasons that I think would be defensible. We're in agreement. So if we take that to the vote members, um, it's on page 53, which is we'll be voting on the recommendation for approval subject to the conditions as set out below and completion of the section 106 agreement in accordance with the head of terms provided within appendix a of this committee report um, can i take it by affirmation that this is a refusal thank you um, thank you everybody so we'll now move to agenda item six which is um, on page 73 of our agenda pack. And this is for application 20 slash 04754 slash HFUL, Reston, Huntingdon Road, Girton. And the proposal is for the removal of an existing rear conservatory to replace with a larger rear extension with canopy. The extension of existing rear and front gables a loft conversion with the addition of roof lights, a replacement garage with workshop above, and new detached outbuilding with tennis court and gym to rear. Um, the applicant is Dr. Ajay Kumar. The recommendation is approval. And the key material considerations for us today are the principle of development, visual amenity and design, residential amenity, drainage, ecology, tree matters and any other matters. It's not a departure um, and the application is being brought to the committee because uh, it's been called into planning committee by both Councillor Bygott and Councillor de Lacey. And I understand that the case officer is Charlotte Pitt. Charlotte, are you with us? Yes. Oh, hello, Charlotte. Hello, good. If you have any updates and then a summary of the application, please. Trying to sort out my screens. <laughs> That's all right. Oops. Sorry. 
sorry, I can't get it on the right screen. Just give me one minute. We can see that now perfectly in presentation mode. Thanks, Charlotte. That's great. Um, okay, so the proposal site for this application is Reston Huntingdon Road in Girton. Um, the proposal seeks permission for the removal of the existing rear conservatory and replacement with larger rear extension with canopy, extension of existing rear and front gable, loft conversion with the addition of roof lights, replacement garage with workshop above and new detached outbuilding. Um, so just an update um, for members, um, hopefully you should have received an email about this last night, um, but just to reiterate what was shared. Um, so in paragraph 64, page 84 of the report pack, um, I advise that president would not be a material planning consideration for this proposal. Um, this is not correct. Um, it's well established that consistency is important in planning decisions and therefore um, previous approvals do form material planning considerations for future assessments. Um, and it is considered that like cases should be decided in a like manner unless other material considerations indicate otherwise. So just to clarify, um, that point in my report was not correct and previous approvals are material to future assessments. Okay, on to the proposal. Um, so this is a site location plan um, alongside an aerial view of the site here. Um, Northwest Cambridge is located at the rear of the site and at the front is Huntingdon Road. Um, this slide shows the existing site um, with some photographs. So in the top left hand corner is the existing garage and driveway area. In the bottom left hand corner is the rear of the dwelling. Um, Top right hand corner is the front of the dwelling um, and bottom right hand corner is the um, garden area as existing. So the next slide is the existing and proposed block plan um, and this shows the proposals. So the garage at the front here, the gable extensions here, the rear extension here and the tennis court here. So the first element um, is the outbuilding with the tennis court. Um, this has been amended slightly just to simplify the form, um, remove some glazing and also the gym element um, which was here was removed. So it's just a tennis court now. Um, you can see on this um, elevation that it's this line indicates that it's set down into the ground um, by 1.5 metres and this is to achieve um, the correct internal heights for a tennis court. Um, the next part is the proposed garage. Um, so this is the existing photograph. Um, the proposed garage would be slightly wider than this element and would propose a room in the roof uh, to be used as a workshop by the occupant of the main house. Um, this is just the elevations to show um, the proposal again. So you've got the um, gable extensions here, rear extension, um, with canopy element here um, and the garage, same on this side. Uh, this is the existing proposed roof plan, just to show the roof lights um, and the rear extension um, and the gable extensions here. Um, and these are just floor plans. So uh, again, rear extension is here with the canopy element across the rear of the dwelling. Um, and the gables extend into the roof to create one additional bedroom at this level. So the key material considerations are um, visual amenity and design, including the um, village amenity area, uh, residential amenity, drainage, equality, tree matters, um, and any other matters. And my recommendation is approved subject to conditions. Thank you very much. Charlotte, and we, if we do have any questions, we'll come to those during the debate. So thank you very much for that. And we'll move to the public speakers. And we have Mr. Mignon, Dominic Mignon. 
Are you with us? I am. Hi there. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Yes, I don't know if I've got your name correctly and my pronunciation. Uh, yeah, pretty well pronounced. Very well done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And you, you do know the protocol, so you have three minutes that you'll be speaking. Um, and Chris Carter on my left here will let us know when you've got two minutes have um, finished and you've got one minute left. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I'll just read um, from my script. So we, the four sets of neighbours of Reston, contacted during the consultation period are unanimous in expressing our objection to the proposed planning application. And first and foremost, to the proposed erection of an approximately 1,800 cubic meter, which is 17 meters by 40 meter footprint, covered tennis court in the back garden of Reston. We understand that your deliberations are based on planning law considerations and believe that a number of the objections brought to your attention by Councillors Bygott, De Lacey and Garvey and the professional planning consultant behind New Hayes' objection letter were indeed grounding in planning regulations. Specifically, we'd like to draw your attention to the following points that are specified in the material planning considerations for council. Referring to local policy plan HQ1 and district design guide SPD, the considerations for scale and massing require the proposal to be the right size for the site and relating appropriately to the buildings and spaces around it. Alongside the consideration for design, it requires the design to be appropriate for the context it is in and needing to enhance the local area. These together need to be closely reviewed as the size and structure of the tennis court building is clearly out of character in this residential area of Girton, opposite Girton College on Huntington Road. The building is three times the size of the main dwelling and with a warehouse-like design, detracts from rather than enhances the local area. Secondly, referring to local policy plan CC slash eight and nine, the consideration for surface water and flooding issues has not been adequately resolved, with a drainage survey suggesting that yet unidentified specialist drainage solutions will be required to deal with the relatively impermeable nature of the soil. We'd like to remind the members of the committee that a number of our back gardens were significantly flooded last winter, not least rest in itself, and fear that such a structure will significantly increase the likelihood of flooding, and we're alarmed and disappointed that no appropriate drainage solution has been proposed or even considered. And lastly, the principle of development and ensuring the right use for the site is of concern to us. And we want to ensure that no business or trade be operated from the construction and ask the committee to consider including a no alternative use clause in their resolution, should they be minded to approve the application. Similarly, we're also asking that a hedge made of mature shrubs of sufficient height be planted to hide the structure from the view of our houses. We are appreciative of the opportunity to voice our material and substantive concerns. And we would also be grateful that, for the committee to take into account the precedent this would create on this section of Huntington Road and the implications this would have on future developments in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for addressing those material considerations because that helps our debate hugely. And um, so that's very clear in our particular presentation from you. And thank you very much. I will open that to turn off. No, no, one moment. I'm going to open it up to any clarification questions from members of the committee if they'd like to address any questions to you. I have Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. I just want to ask some clarification. You mentioned the fact that some of your gardens flooded uh, recently. Can you just expand a bit more on that? Which, you know, which side are you on of the, uh, yes, of the proposal? Um, and Chris, I'm to the left of... Um, to the left of Reston, if you if you observe us from Huntington Road, uh -huh. and so the houses along us. So the house next to me, to the left of myself, which is Middlefield, the entire garden was flooded and underwater. So it, and I'm, I think some of the councillors have seen photos of it. It was like a lake. Um, Reston itself was halfway underwater um, in the back of the garden, and my garden personally was actually only minimally flooded at the back. But then as you went along the houses another one two three even if you went three four houses along there were flooding issues into the back of the garden we're backed onto by eddington and the eddington development and there's there's a belief i think we believe there's been compacted soil uh, which makes the drainage even harder to go away down towards the m11 um kind of side of the building so yeah it was considerable it was material and it was there for a, a considerable amount of time okay right thank you Thank you. Um, and we have Ben Watt. Thank you very much. And sticking to the same point around flooding, um, 
I don't know if you've seen the papers, but one of the conditions we have associated um, should the approval be granted today would be that a full drainage system or scheme, sorry, needs to be approved by this council before any work is undertaken. I just wanted to ask if that condition went some way to sort of um, alleviating your concerns and your the other neighbours' concerns as well. Yeah, thanks for the question. Unfortunately not, and it's, I think actually listening to the, the session previous to this, um, I, I would have expected that actually a, uh, a review and an actual um, positioning of the drainage solution would have been designed as part of the design and application. If you actually look at the report, it actually just tests the impermeability of the soil right now. And I think it says that it would need some form of drainage solution. I can't remember technically what it's called, but it's some form of significant size solution, which on the size of the property that they have and what's left with the garden in Reston, I'm not actually sure where they would put it. So um, obviously if there was a solution, that would be good. I'm not sure where it would be and I'm not sure why it was not considered and that they only did a, an impermeability study of the soil as it stands right now and not the impact of runoff water and impermeability of the building. Okay, that's clear, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mignon, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. You, you can turn off time. your video and audio now, thank you very much. Um, we don't, um, do you have any parish council? We don't have any um, presentations from the parish council, but we do have um, two local members who are um, here and would you like to speak now, Councillor Tom Bygott? Thank you, Chairman. I recommend refusal for this item. The planning grounds are listed in the call-in letter that Councillor Lacey and I jointly sent on February the 18th and are quoted in the agenda pack. The two parts of the application I want to talk about today are the two-story garage building in the front garden and the warehouse-type structure in the rear garden housed an indoor tennis court. The top end of Huntington Road is one of the most magnificent settings for mature trees in a residential street in Cambridgeshire. It has enormous value, both aesthetic and ecological, and makes a substantial contribution to the public realm, part of which stems from the generous proportions of the front gardens and the view from the street of the tree canopy. If a garage is necessary and cannot be accommodated elsewhere on site, it should be limited to a single story. And secondly, the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order 2015 is generous in its allowances for ancillary buildings under Class E, especially when the 50% rule is applied to blocks of land over an acre. It is sufficient for many structures, including swimming pools, gymnasia, squash courts, and stables. However, it is not sufficient for indoor tennis courts. This, because, this is because tennis is normally an outdoor sport and because the Lawn Tennis Association recommends a nine meter ceiling height above net line for indoor courts, which is, which is not achievable within the class E rules. The building is therefore to be used for a home game, somewhat approximating, but not quite meeting the standard for tennis. The design compromise is worse than it seems because the architect has not spotted that indoor tennis courts almost always have transverse rather than longitudinal roof ridges. The exceptions are where ceiling height is not the limiting factor. Calculations in paragraph 32 of the report are therefore incorrect. Because this building exceeds the maximum ridge height permitted under class E, it becomes a subject for local plan and district design guide with respect to its excessive footprint, excessive volume, unsightly appearance, and increase to the local flood risk in a way that buildings allowed under permitted development are not. The council has full discretion in these matters and is under no obligation to grant permission for any ancillary structure greater than four meters in height. Paragraphs 26 and 27 express the concern that weight must be given to what is possible under permitted development rights. The best way of dealing with this concern is not to approve the application in full, but to exclude the tennis court and apply the sorry, allow the applicant to apply for a lawful development certificate under Class E. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Councillor Bygott? No. Thank you very much. Very clear. And Councillor Corin Garvey, who is 
online with us. Are you with us, Councillor Garvey? Yes, can you see me? We can hear you. Can you see? Oh, oh. I'm trying to turn the camera on. <coughs> My camera's not coming on. We can hear you. We can hear you perfectly. So if you're happy to, to read out or to tell us what you know what your statement would be, Councillor Garvey. Yes, I um, just like to say that I, I support the objections voiced by Dominic Mignon and Tom Bygott. As soon as I was appointed district councillor in May, the residents contacted me. The Huntington Row. Of, uh, Huntington Road row of houses are rather special with of a similar age and height but with individual designs. The residents are a close community who care very much about the environment in which they live. Um, the, their case in objecting to the building of a covered tennis court at Reston seems very sound. The neighbours showed me the layout of their gardens mostly laid out as lawn. The covered tennis court would take up most of the garden at rest and being three times the area of the house itself. So it'd be out of character with, with the rest of the row. And in addition, um, there's the flooding problem and a neighbour showed me a photo of his lawn earlier this year, which had become a lake. Uh, the risk of flooding is, is likely to increase. So I recommend the planning committee to reject the construction of the covered tennis court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for Councillor Garvey? No, thank you very much for that, Councillor Garvey. Um, and we open it to debate. Thank you very much. Councillor Deborah Roberts to start. Thank you very much, Carmen. Um, one feels a little bit lost for words at the thought of this building. Um, it really does look more akin to a commercial warehouse and we all do know I'm sure we all do know that part of um, Cambridge and it is um, really still one of the most attractive entrances to the village and and really quite important and yeah um, the, the tree line there is is very obvious and um, it, it, it does still have that very rural feel um, I take on board that this very large part of it is at the back but I am concerned about a two-story garage at the front there um, and, and would really wonder why you need a two-storey garage to his own, I suppose. But I think it's really just the, the mass bulk um, and size of that um, so-called um, indoor tennis court that really um, I find um, unacceptable. I think it's um, it very detrimental to um, the area. I think it's very detrimental um, and unsympathetic to neighbours, um, and I shall be voting against it, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in terms of those um, reasons that you gave, which do echo um, from the residents and also from the two councillors that we heard, so we have scale and massing, and the design and visual amenity issue at that tentative entrance to Huntington Road. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think taking them in, in sections, we've kind of got the garage, the extension, and and then the tennis court, um, and with what it comes with. Um, the, when it comes to actually the house itself, I, I can't say that I'm unsupportive to it. I think it's yeah, because you just you're removing one thing and replacing it with another. So that I I don't see any particular issue with the the garage. Um, I have to say, I think that probably, again, could be, could be deemed as, as acceptable. But the tennis court and that massive building, essentially, there's no other word to describe it. It's massive. Um, it's so much bigger than even the house. And I, I do think that it will create a very dominant, and unsightly view and I appreciate view is it's a difficult one but I, I do agree with what Councillor Bygot said about the full factor vision you know, there is 
they obviously have a, a way of doing things that are within local development, you know, and and that is there. That is an option open to them. But when we look at this, that it is, I mean, it says point seven isn't really material in the report, and I actually think that is like a, almost a twenty percent increase in the heights. So to me, that is material, and I, I just don't see how we can approve something like that and the impact that that will have on the on the local area i think the principle for the tennis court is just in its building is just not there but if if this was to go into a different way to what i i think chair then i really don't think it's unreasonable as a resident to ask for trees and and some form of of um landscaping to how you would hide a building that size i don't know but to make some attempt to do so so um, I would want to move that just in case of the event of the committee um, recommending it, but but I would strongly hope that others don't. Yeah, so again, we we have their um, scale, massing, design, and visual amenity. So we've got different adjectives you're describing as the dominant and unsightly and um, the impact on this um, part of, of Huntington Road. So members, any other? Issues which we've already Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, my concern is about the um, the size of the tennis court and the amount of ground it's covering and the potential for surface water flooding. Um, I have experience of this in my own village where um, people have built on back gardens where uh, the neighbours are have been severely affected by surface water flooding that just doesn't. Um, go away for most of the winter so I would want to see something much more robust in terms of how how that could be mitigated rather than uh, a condition thank you thank you um, councillor Jeff Harvey thank you chair um, well I'm concerned really that the, the report has kind of been written in reverse um, sort of as a way to sort of justify the position that the permitted development rights kind of somehow grant this anyway. Um, because when you read, for example, on page 79 of the agenda pack, um, paragraph 30, it says, the proposal is a subservient building in the rear garden. The design and appearance would be considered appropriate for an outbuilding, which are often finished in materials that differ from the main house. I mean, how could anyone truthfully say that that was appropriate. I mean, there seems to be an exercise in sort of uh, justifying the outcome, um, which has already been decided. So I, I, I can't really say that I would consider that appropriate. But also, I'm kind of slightly convinced when I was reading this last night, when I, my um, presumption, as you know, Councillor Bygots alluded to, that the ridge line would be over the net, but it isn't. So I mean, I just really rather they called it what it is rather than pretending it's a tennis court because um, you wouldn't be able to attempt even the slightest loft, uh, sort of loft on a shot, <laughs> let alone a log shot, when you've only got three and a half metres. I mean, that's the height of somebody holding a tennis racket. It, it's kind of ridiculous. So I think, <laughs> well, I can't say anymore. I just think um, it, it's, yeah, I, I wouldn't approve this. Um, yes, yeah, so I, and we, we need to check on a couple of things. So I think what I'm hearing from you, Councillor Harvey, is the issue about sort of principal development in terms of ancillary and subservient. You know, as the principle around that, it just doesn't seem to be subservient or ancillary in, in the way that we would describe it. Um, I would like to clarify a little bit about log shots um, with the case officer. And just to, as we do, the design is down in the ground. So it goes down, I think it's 1.5 meters into the ground so i just want to clarify if the actual height within the building is as asserted by councillor harvey charlotte can you do that for us um yep so i think i've covered it a little bit in my report um in terms of the heights so um, on paragraph paragraph 23 
sorry, bear with me, I'll just have a look. I think there's another part later on um, about the size of the tennis court, what's recommended and what this would be. Is that, so we've got paragraph 32. Yes, that's right. So we've got paragraph 30, so, 23 talks about an internal height of 6.2 metres and paragraph 32 that the height of an indoor tennis court should be 5.75 at the baseline and 9 metres at the net line. Yes, but that is at the um, ridge, so the highest internal height. So yes, the um, where it slopes to the eaves, it would be um, lower. It would be lower than, the, than what was recommended, which is what Councillor Bygot has mentioned in his thing as yes. well. Thank you. Um, and um, what I would like to, when we, if we're looking at surface water drainage, what we do have to do is a bit more specific because, in fact, with the, the consultees, I said even though they had concerns, they thought that it was acceptable. So we would need to know where our concerns are around, around the drainage. Councillor Heather Williams. No. Oh, no, sorry. Councillor Dr. Claire Donaldson, sorry. Um, yes, thank you. I want to take up the point um, on the precedent setting. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we haven't really, we touched on that right at the beginning of the presentation, but surely we have to be mindful of that in this case, um, because it, it is such a huge building and the effect of that on the neighbours. And if we set, if um, we were to approve this, it would set a precedent um, which would affect uh, the neighbouring properties in many different ways, not least in terms of potential for flooding. So I think we ought to be mindful of that precedent setting here. Thank you. And Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. There's, there's one other thing that I might need to clarify with the officers is, um, I don't know about anybody else, but I've played indoor tennis, um, which is why I might have to declare an interest actually, because I can't, genuinely can't remember if, I'm, remember if I'm still a member of the Lawn Tennis Association. But um, I, when you play inside, the noise is amplified in, incredibly so. And that's not, that noise isn't normally contained to the building itself. Um, you know, it's when you're, when you're serving, you, you're outside, normally you would, wouldn't even really hear other than a slight that, but in, indoors it really is. I used to play in, in a dome, which was an air-filled dome. So you had all that noise and you could still hear every shot. Um, not to mention it's, it becomes, when you're speaking, it's a very echo, there's not much to, so my understanding is there isn't any sort of sound boards or anything so that can, I think, so the issue would be um, around the noise pollution. So I don't know if we have anything for environmental health around noise pollution. Yeah, it, it's not just noise, but, but I think it also comes into residential amenity yeah. in that people having an outdoors that, that's what noise game pollution is very would be. different to indoors. So this would be kind of this would be noise pollution, which would have an impact on residential amenity of anybody around. Yeah. Can we just ask if the we, I don't see anything for environmental health on noise pollution. Charlotte, do we have anything on that? Uh, no, environmental health um, weren't involved in the application um, because the nature of an outbuilding is that it should be um, in scale with the sort of domestic use and that noise pollution shouldn't be over and above um, what you'd expect in a sort of domestic setting. Right, but we're not looking at domestic settings at all, are we? Yes. Okay. okay I, thank you. If I can say that, if again, if it was, if the members were mine to approve, we need to do something, some sort of conditioning, because yeah. the noise will be astronomical. Dr. Tim Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think the the issue of the drainage and the flooding for me is still a big one, um, because that building will be taking up a heck of a lot of ground space which would normally be used for infiltration. And as we've heard uh, from the local members and um, the neighbours, even that part of the garden has been flooded. Um, and if we look at paragraphs 59 and 60 mm -hmm. on page 83, mm -hmm. where, I mean, the, the drainage the, uh, the drainage officer has kind of like, yeah, okay, the fact that you know it's going to be set down 1.5 meters into the ground means that it's you know it's not, uh, it might not matter if we flood because it's not um, sort of habitable. But that still says there will be flooding, <laughs> almost. So what what are we doing looking at it in terms of even considering 
giving this thing um, permission. And it will affect, will still affect the makers. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but that, the fact that it doesn't actually solve, this thing doesn't solve the drainage issues or the flooding issues, for me, is a, a big no. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. And so if we're looking at that in terms of drainage, so in that paragraph 60, so the drainage office advised that the building may be subject to flooding. So it recognises that there could be flooding. That's at, at the end of that, there's flooding in that. But however, confirmed that it would not increase surface water risk to surrounding property. So it's not addressing the flooding within that property itself, which is what you're, what, what you're contesting. Your, your microphone. microphone. I'm not a drainage engineer. Yeah. But... Um, I don't see that it actually solves the problem of flooding to neighboring properties either. Yeah. Flooding in its own right in there <laughs> um, you know, will still occur. Yes, yeah. Good, so um, I haven't heard anything that would suggest that we need to start looking at conditions if we're to move to approval. Um, so I would like to hear from Chris Carter if there were reasons for recommending you know, refusal. I think we've heard scale, massing, design vision may include but not going. Yeah, so I've got a couple of reasons uh, here. Um, the detached outbuilding by virtue of its scale, footprint, massing, height, and utilitarian design would result in a form of development that would not be subservient to the main dwelling and would represent a sizable intrusion into the rear garden that would be out of keeping with the character of the area. As such, the proposed development would be contrary to policy HG1 of the South Hand Local Plan and paragraphs 7.10 and 7.11 of the District Design Guide. Um, and then, with regard to um, the concerns about drainage, um, the committee could consider the proposed outbuilding would increase flood risk by removing a substantial area of permeable land and, due to its lowered floor level, would itself be susceptible to flooding. Insufficient information has been submitted to demonstrate that surface water from the outbuilding and other extensions proposed within the application can be adequately disposed of in a manner that is both sustainable and avoids unacceptable flood risk from site and surrounding properties. As such, the development contrary to policy CP7, CP8 and 9 of the South Cambridge Local Plan 2018. I'm going to put it back on my cuff. So um, do we take that by affirmation, members, that that's a refusal? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, members. We'll move to um, agenda item seven, page 87 in your agenda pack. This is application 21 slash 02538 slash H full over 30 Hilton Street. The proposal is for a two story rear extension and two additional gable windows. The applicant is Mr. Paul McNeamy. Um, the key material considerations for us to consider the character and appearance of the area, residential amenity, and highway matters. It's not a departure, and it's been brought before us because it, a staff member um, of the South Cambridge District Council is part of the applicant's household. The presenting officer is Charlotte Spencer. Charlotte, are you with us? Hi, morning, Chair. Morning, Charlotte. Okay, we just have a brief presentation. You look very Renaissance, I must say. Very <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. We can see it and in presentation mode as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is for 30 Hilton Street in Over. Uh, it's for two story rear extension and two additional gable windows. And as the chair's just stated, the application to come to committee of the applicant as a member of staff. Here to just show the site location. Uh, the property is a two story detached dwelling house located to the southwest of Hilton Street. Um, the brick and tile dwelling is set back from the road by a large area of hard standing. And as you can see, it is set further back than its immediate neighbours at number 28 and number 32. Uh, number 28 is a grade two listed building and the site lies within the over development framework. Okay. 
Uh, so they're seeking planning permission for a two-storey rear extension and for two additional gable windows. The extension would have a depth of 2.587 metres and would span the full width of the existing outrigger. At ground floor, it would also adjoin the existing garage and which would be converted to habitable space. The extension uh, would be characterised by a hipped roof with a maximum height of 7.13 metres. Um, two new side facing windows would be installed on the northwestern elevation and a first floor side window would be installed on the southeastern elevation. Uh, just some photos here's the property here you can see it's further back than its neighboring property of 28 and 32. Uh, this is the site from Unwinds Lane so you can see the listed building at 28 here and it's a barn building and you can see the property just here and this is just further up Unwinds Lane and you can see the property is here. Uh, so the material Considerations for the impact and character of the appearance of the area and of the impact on the heritage assets and the impact on neighbour amenities. Um, the application is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, and you know there are there are no applications to speak by parish council or any objectors. Um, as we know, this is coming through because of transparency. Um, it's one of the members of staff about the household. So do you, we'll move straight to debate, members. Then we'll move straight to vote. Do we, um, the recommendation upon which we are voting is for approval on page 91, thank you very much, Vice Chair, which is to recommend planning permission subject to the private planning conditions which follow from page 90, or on page 91 and end on page 92. Can I take it by affirmation that this is approved? Thank you very much. We move to agenda item eight on page 93 of our report pack. This is application 21 stroke 02726 stroke Esh Full, 6 Westfield Road, Foulmere. The proposal is for a single story rear extension, replacing existing outbuildings with associated internal alterations. The applicant is South Council District Council. Key material considerations, character, visual amenity, heritage impact, residential amenity, highway safety and parking provision, um, and any other matters. It's not a departure, and it's being brought to the committee again for transparency because this is South Council District Council as the applicant. The presenting officer is Michael Sexton. Michael, are you with us? Hi, Anne. Good afternoon, Chair. Hello. Good. We can see you. Do you have any updates or, or a summary of the application? No, no updates, Chair. Happy to go straight to the presentation. Uh, could you confirm, Chair, that you can see mine? Yep, perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, this is uh, an application for a single story rear extension that is before the committee because South Cambridge District Council is, is the applicant. Um, the site is located in Falmouth on Westfield Road as identified by the site edge red um, near to the primary school over to the east. This is the block plan that just shows the single story rear extension that's proposed. The dashed line represents the outbuilding um, and covered walkway that links the outbuilding that's to be demolished to accommodate the proposed development. In terms of constraints, the site is entirely within the development framework boundary of Balmere, um, near to the Grade 2 listed school building, opposite the recreation ground, which has a free preservation order and is also a protected village amenity area. For context, this is a photograph of the rear elevation of the property, so you can see the existing outbuilding that's to be demolished. Um, also worth noting that both properties on either side have got fairly large single-storey additions, particularly the adjoining neighbour to the left of that photo. And this is just a, an image of the front of the site. And again, you can see the, the outbuilding in the back, which would be demolished. So the application is proposing a flat roof single-storey extension, um, as shown on these plans, and some minor alterations to the fenestration, windows and doors of, of the side elevation of the existing property. And here you can see the the proposed extension sitting in the context of the neighbouring uh, extension as well. 
and just a floor plan of the proposed extension uh, is to accommodate the particular needs of the occupants that are now within the site. Um, and again, this wall here is the adjoining neighbour and their existing single storey extension. So you can see how it's actually been stepped to accommodate this high level window that's present on the side of the neighbouring extension. Uh, key considerations, uh, character and visual amenity, heritage impact, residential amenity, highway safety and parking provision. And as set out in the committee report, officers are satisfied that the proposal is fully compliant with adopted policy. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you very much. And again, we don't have any presentations being um, made. Do we have any? Yep. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, and through you, um, yes, I, I have no objections to this, quite the opposite. And I would say that, yes, um, the row of houses were all originally council houses, but some of them are now um, privately owned, but this is still a, a council house. Um, it is going to be adapted for a family's specific physical needs. And, and I actually commend the uh, housing department for actually going along this route. Um, I think it's, it's very good. I think it's very sensitive of them and I'm very pleased. And thank you very much, housing department. And I hope that we'll also accept it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Do I have any other to speak? Shall we move to a vote? Um, the vote would be to page 100, which is recommended approval, subject to the conditions that are on pages 100 and 101. Can I take it? Sorry, Chairman, a little bit of concern. Just need clarification from the officers. It is in the paperwork. Um, it's very near the school, and parking down there is very restricted. So we must make sure that at school going in times and leaving times, we don't get a conflict um, from the contractor's vehicles. Yep, but Condi it is in there. Condition C is, is yeah. in there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. So we will now go to a vote. So that is on page 100. The recommendation is to approve the application subject to the conditions on page 100 and 101. Can I take it by affirmation that this is an approval? Thank you very much. We now move to agenda item 9. This is on page 103 of our agenda pack. Um, and we're now moving into a series of, of applications which are around hedgerows and trees. So this one is application 21 stroke 0794 stroke TTHR in Cottenham. It's the land at the junction of Smithy Fen and 20 Pence Road. The proposal is for the removal of one section of hedgerow seven metre long to facilitate the pipeline laying of a new sewer. The applicant is Anglian Water Services. The key material considerations, do the hedgerows qualify as important hedgerows, is the removal justified? Um, the application is being brought to the committee because all hedgerow regulation matters must come to the committee, quite rightly. Presenting officer Miriam Hill. Doesn't look like Miriam. Um, Miriam, are you with us? No. Uh, but I will, uh, but Councillor Deborah Roberts won't, who is in the room, but won't partake in this discussion. Can I just ask clarification? I think last time it was on, I was allowed to stay in the room, but I took no part in that yes. one. Yes. Okay, thank you. We agreed at the beginning of the meeting, so that, that continues. Um, yes. Is that Mr.? So, Councillor Loveluck, if you could just turn off your video just for now, and we'll just listen to the case officer first. Thank you very much. Miriam, hello, welcome. It's lovely to see you again. We've got you on for the, for the rest of the session. So, good. Do you want to give us any update on this or a summary of the application? Um, there is no update as far as I'm aware, so I'm happy to go straight to the slideshow, if Thank that's you. okay with you. Yes, please. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. So, as you have um, already uh, discussed, this is in relation to the hedgerow removal notice in Cottenham. This links with the recent removal notice, um, which was to remove five sections of seven, five seven metre sections of hedgerow, reference 21 stroke 0662 stroke TTHR. 
the agent is essentially moving one of the sections which was going to be taken out further down the road to gain a better connection to the existing sewer uh, system. So here on the screen, you can see uh, Cottenham. The area we're looking at is on the north side, illustrated by the arrow. And the particular section has now been moved from the bend to the junction. Um, the agent did uh, intonate that they would be doing this and they were asked to withdraw the one gap from the previous notice and to then submit this new notice with just the one section to be removed. But unfortunately, that's not the route they took. They decided to leave the old notice as was and then submit this. So there's not an intention to take two gaps out of that hedgerow, there's just the intention to take one gap out of that hedgerow. So it's just a bit more of a close-up, so it is, the gap will be right on that junction. And here is a Google Street View to just illustrate the gap. The gap will be between the street sign and then the other road signage, the Chevron signs, which are to the left. The hedgerow is considered an important hedgerow under the regulations due to its age and its location uh, having existed there since pre-enclosure. We did receive one consultation response from the parish council who objected on grounds of there was no need for the removal of the hedgerow there's no mention of a replacement and it's detrimental to the farmland landscape. Um, on the notice form, the application form, um, it does state that it's needed to facilitate the connection of a new sewer pipe to the existing um, system that's there. Unfortunately, the agent didn't say they were going to undertake replacement, um, but as an organisation, they typically reinstate the hedgerow to what was um, already there, so they will be providing uh, replacement planting, but they didn't state that on the notice. Um, and in relation to it being detrimental to the friendly landscape, this is actually beyond the purview of the regulations because the hedgerow regulations come out of the Environment Act and not the Town and Country Planning Act. In considering removal notice, notices, the reason for removal is key. Um, unfortunately, they can't locate the gap in another location they have decided that this is the best point at which to connect the new pipe work to the existing sewer system. And where a set of pipe works changes direction or there's a, like a junction in the pipe work, they have to excavate and um, for short runs as well, they also have to excavate. They can't directionally drill. Um, so this is why this section of hedgerow needs to be removed. So officers recommend that the reason for removal is reasonable as no other method or location can be utilised. Therefore, we recommend the planning committee do not issue a hedgerow retention notice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Um, and again, we'll come back to you during the, during the debate if there are any sort of questions for that. Um, and speakers, we do have from the... Parish Council, Councillor John Lovelock, you are with us, you saw earlier. Hello there. Hello, hi, and thanks for um, the clarification, Miriam, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this. Good, thank you. So you do uh, know the protocol, that we've, you've got three minutes, and I must ask you to confirm that you've got permission to um, speak on behalf of the Parish Council. I do. I'm Chair of the Planning Committee of Cotton Parish Council, and we've discussed this at two meetings, but I definitely do have permission. 
Thank you very much. So, Mr. Carter's on my left, so he will let me know when two minutes are up, um, but you have three minutes starting from you. Okay. I, mean, I don't think I'm going to need that long. I think it's a very simple statement. Um, we're actively looking in Cotton at ways of increasing biodiversity of the local environment, and there's a number of activities in progress. And unnecessary removal of the hedgerows is certainly something that we resist. Uh, and then that's important. We all know the importance of hedgerows. And one aspect of hedgerows which is important is continuity, because they do form corridors for wildlife. And uh, in this case, destruction of, I'm pleased to Miriam for it. I have been, been meaning to do some research on the age of this day stuff in closure. So it is a very mature, established, ancient hedge. I do have put a couple of pictures in my uh, visual presentation, which I sent in earlier, which shows sort of slightly more vibrant, mature views of the hedges than the one which was in the planning application. Um, and we did note in recommending refusal of this that uh, SCDC had recently approved five separate submunitive sections of the hedge to be removed in connection with this sewer. Uh, I understand now that's down to five in total rather than six in total. So it's 35 metres of hedge road to be removed in connection with one sewer. And I found interesting in your acceptance letter, you recommend hedgelink.org.uk as a source of reference for good management. And uh, one of the indicators that website recommends for a healthy hedge is to ensure there are no gaps more than five metres. So we're now talking about seven metres uh, with a significant number of gaps for one sewer. We also made note that the, just, the application makes no attempt at all to justify the need to remove of such a large section of the hedge. I believe Miriam might have given some hint as to why Green Water thinks they want to remove seven metres of hedge put through one uh, sewer pipe, but it does seem excessive if every time a sewer crosses the hedge line we need to remove seven metres of hedge. And I understand reinstatement will take place, uh, but on the other hand, reinstatement of a 200-year-old, if one likes to say exactly how old, but in excess of 100-year-old hedge, takes time, put it that way, quite simply. So um, I think what we're making it clear is that we do not see um, hedgerow removal. Hedgerows are not just a barrier to a developer who wants to put something in place, and uh, we think they should come up with a solution which does not require removal of seven metres each time they cross a hedge line. Uh, having said that, we're totally in favour of the sewer. It's an important piece of infrastructure which we're totally in favour of. Uh, so we want to make it clear that there's no hint of that. But uh, we would request this particular application is refused. Thank you very much. Um, do any of the members have questions? Councillor Lovelock. No, thank you very much for your time, Councillor Lovelock. And, um, we now move to local members, and I understand that Ms Carter has a statement to read from Councillor Gough. Mr Chair, uh, yes, so these are the comments of Neil Gough of Scotland Ward. Uh, my apologies that I cannot attend the committee in person, but I would be very grateful if you would permit me to make some brief comments on this application. A full page of Anglian Water's biodiversity strategy was dedicated to hedgerows, hedgerows page 24 and includes the statement, hedgerows provide essential networks across the landscape by connecting fragmented habitats as well as providing a habitat resource in their own right. The strategy also references habitat loss on page six and includes the sentences, the loss of habitat leads to fragmentation and isolation of remaining habitat patches. This reduces species ability to move in the landscape and increases the threat of local extinctions. I could not have expressed the importance of linear mature hedgerows any better. Cottenham has lost a number of precious linear mature hedgerows with the recent housing developments that is most regrettable. While, while I'm supportive of the overall Anglian Water project, I would ask the committee to assure itself in the context of this specific application that a reduction of a hedgerow of this magnitude is absolutely necessary. The Parish Council has expressed views on the matter and uh, that I urge you to consider carefully. I note the comment in the report at paragraph 23 that this route appears to be the optimal location for this work. This hardly conveys to me the completion of the exhaustive review of alternatives that one would surely reasonably expect to meet the sufficient justification test for the removal of the hedge. I also note the article by George Monbiot only this week, 
on the particularly special value of complex established habitat, which is often lost in haste and never truly recovered. He wrote, don't lament the old oak we're felling, we'll plant 10 saplings and plus 600 yards in its place, then we'll call it net gain. He captures the problems of such narrow approaches to biodiversity very well. I'm concerned that the reference to a typical reinstatement in the report is exactly that. While acknowledging that Anglian Water is under no obligation to replace the full biodiversity loss if no objection is given by the committee, I think it is reasonable to expect on the basis of its biodiversity strategy and the specific references to hedgerows that Anglian Water would commit to replace the biodiversity loss associated with any hedgerow removed. It would be good to hear confirmation of that along with a clarification and recognition that such a mature and rich habitat cannot simply cannot be simply exchangeable for a typical reinstatement, whatever that might be. That's it. Thank you. Um, the other local members, Councillor Eileen Wilson, would you like to speak now? Yes. Um, um, my, um, I, I concur with um, Councillor Grant's um, points that he made. I'm also very disappointed that if this stretch of seven metres is to replace another stretch that's already been um, permitted, that that hasn't been included in the application. I'm also very disappointed that although the applicant has said they would replace the, um, the hedgerow, and I understand that there aren't any requirements on them to do so, I do feel that this will be a great loss, especially at that point in of the village on the road which is very visible when people are driving along. So I, I would really like to understand much more if there is an alternative to uh, removing this hedgerow. And I, I would like to see a lot more justification for that. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for Councillor Eileen Wilson? No, I just said here. No, no questions. Oh, for, oh. First of all, we just ask first of all if there's a question for any of the speakers. There isn't, so we'll now move to the debate and Councillor Dr. Claire Thorne. Oh, Heather Williams first. Thank you, Chair. It was it was just to ask if there's any way. So they've they've put through the previous one. We've now got this one on the grounds that they're not going to do that other one. But I just want to clarify that we can't actually stop them taking up six pieces if we grant this, can we? We we you know they've got permission to take it all up. And the argument for the last application was this was the only way to do it. Well, obviously it wasn't because we've now got this. And what happens when this isn't the only way to do it? Do we then keep giving permissions and hoping that they don't take them all out? Um, it seems so perhaps, perhaps we go back to Miriam on it. Miriam, so you know you can understand a little bit, but well, certainly kind of the disquiet that you had, where you obviously asked for, for a very clear removal of the original one to replace it with this, and that didn't happen. Um, so yes, can you do the disquiet? Obviously, you can hear amongst members that you know that this has just been changed without any kind of guarantees being given that this isn't in sort of creep in a way. Yeah. So. Um, there is no guarantee, and the reason there's no guarantee is the hedgerow regulations are somewhat um, flimsy oh. in their <laughs> process requirements. Um, they're notoriously um, uh, uh, not, not quite to the standard of maybe other regulations that are out there. They're, lo they're long due a, a review. Yes. They, the hedgerow regulations came out in 97, and at the time of publishing, they actually said, we will be reviewing these in like the next two years because we know they're not quite right, but politically they had to adopt them at that time. Um, unfortunately, the review never happened. So it is a notice that they give us. It isn't an application. So it is slightly different. It's more akin to a concert section 211 tree works notice than a planning application, for instance. Um, they have asked for seven meter gaps, but I don't believe 
from speaking to the agent that they will be taking out seven meters in every location. They'll only take out what they need to take out, but it, I think they say seven meters just in case, because seven meters is actually wider than the average road, and they don't actually need that, even to, if they need to access a large lorry for delivery of materials, etc., on site. So I think they somewhat over egg the estimation of how much they need to take out. Um, so Miriam, so kind of the question was, so you know, if there isn't any guarantees, you've answered that question, so there's not any guarantees, but do you want to come back, Heather? Yeah, no, the, my, my question was around, we were told last time that this was needed and there wasn't any other way, hence we gave, we gave approval, is my, is my recollection correct? Um, but now we're being told, no, we don't need that bit, we need this new bit. So in your opinion, could they do what they need to do without this? They could just use the one they've already got permission for. Where is the actual so, need to have this because it runs us at a risk? So I believe previously the reason they had asked to take out the section further north on the same run of Hedgerow was they were connecting the sewer into an existing uh, sewer line that comes out of the back of the, um, like this little, little industrial commercial unit there. But now they want to connect into the main sewer pipe that's within that road, 20 pence road system, rather than behind the building. It's a better connection point. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Dr. Kedonton. Yeah, thank you. Um, is it normal to have just two short paragraphs? Um, justifying and reasoning um, something like this. I mean, if, if you're talking, I think John Lovelock mentioned a pre-enclosure hedge. Well, that's well over 200 years old. And yet we just have a few sentences justifying it with no um, detailed diagrams or anything. And it does seem to be very unclear um, from the response to um, Councillor Heather Williams. And then if we go into paragraph 24, it says the regulations are clear the hedgerows or sections should only be permitted to be removed in exceptional cases. I, I, I don't think that we've got sufficient justification um, just to allow this section to be removed, from, particularly because it's in such a prominent area, such a prominent part of the village. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chris Card would like to come back. I, I suppose just to um, add to the point that Miriam made, um, we're rather limited by what the regulations say we can and can't consider in these applications. Uh, I think you've identified that the key test is whether or not the satisfied the information that's been provided is adequate to demonstrate that it's required. I don't know if Miriam can say any more about that test. Um, and if the council isn't satisfied that test, what the alternative decision is and what the implications of that decision might be um, for the council. And and before Miriam comes in, so I'm down to speak mm -hmm. next. No. Um, and I think, given that the that, sort of legislation, um, as you're talking about this, Miriam, is lagging behind, you know, where we are all in terms of just policy and need um, to recognise the sensitivity and value of hedgerows. Um, the fact that is recognised by Anglia Water because they, above and beyond regulation, have got a biodiversity strategy in their own documents and in their own policies. And we as a council have got a doubling nature strategy. So I think what we can do is expect more recognition and respect for that so that they do provide more evidence. They do provide the guarantees. They do provide um, a reassurance that, that it, this is absolutely necessary under exceptional circumstances and how they will replace. So we have those guarantees in place, which is the minimum that we could be asking for. But at the moment, to just have acceptable, um, just because the, regula the regulations are lacking, I don't think is, is enough. So, and again, I would go back to what Chris Carter's question then would be, you know, what happens if we say no? But for me, I would be saying I don't want to give. 
to uh, approve the notice. Councillor Heather Williams. I, I was just going to say, while, while I agree that there are these things in place, I do disagree that there is no guarantee. They are strategies. The implementation of those strategies is entirely down to the third, you know, the, the parties of it at the time. There's no requirement for them to do it. There's no monitoring that they have to achieve X, Y, and Z. It's an aspiration, those strategies. It, there's warm words. There is no guarantees. So I just thought that needed clarifying. No, which is why we would like to say that they, they don't have to, they could tell us that, yes, we will do this voluntarily. That's what we're saying. So we're setting in terms of the kind of standards we would like, even though the regulation doesn't demand it. That was more, I think, the point, maybe. So, Miriam, do you want to answer Chris's question for a minute? <laughs> so, to clarify, I believe Chris's question was to just um, give an indication of what the um, sort of guidelines on reasons for... The test. Um, yeah. So, um, the, there is a piece of... Um, documentation which gives some clarification about what would be deemed unacceptable reasons. So it gives um, things like um, the hedgerow is too difficult to maintain or too expensive to maintain. It blocks light. Um, we don't like the look of it. They're kind of reasons that are um, insubstantial or very ambiguous. Um, it doesn't give a defined sort of set of lists because every scenario is so different. But in terms of what's exceptional, it doesn't, it just says what's, yeah. Yeah, it gives, gives very broad guidelines of what would be deemed unacceptable, uh, an unacceptable reasoning for removal. So, sort of, um, those things such as we don't like the look of it, it's too expensive to maintain, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. And, and would you think that sufficient justification, in your you know, technical opinion, sufficient justification has been given? I would suggest there is. Whilst I was undertaking the site visit um, for the previous notice, I did speak to a local gentleman, so this is anecdotal evidence, but he did say that the sewer system in that particular area is somewhat overwhelmed on occasion and that they do desperately need a new sewer system. Right, but, but for example, we could have something that comes to us that says, we understand that you know, five metres, we can do it within the five metres because we understand that you know, the importance of this hedgerow and we can tell you that we, we will definitely include in the statement that we will replace if we have to do that five metre rather than going for the seven metres and, you know, and we're not going to say whether we're going to take out the other one that we've already got approval for. Ideally, they would have given us that information, but unfortunately, it's a very low bar, the notice that they have to give us, and agents often go for the lowest possible quality notice. And what, and what, happens, what happens if we don't, because um, we know that this is just, notice we're being given notice so what happens if we do not issue a hedgerow retention notice or do so issue sorry do issue of a hedgerow retention so notice. if we do issue a hedgerow retention notice uh, we need to do that within 42 days of uh, their submission to us um i haven't got that date to hand but it is probably in about two weeks time and um they then can choose to appeal that notice or reconsider their options. Okay, thank you. Dr. Timmy Hall, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, I think I, I am not happy about them not actually coming in with what we asked them to, which is to remove one of the ones we already have yeah. um, and replace that as for replacement for this one. And it, it just seems to me that uh, they're not, I, I, I'm, I can't think of a polite. Well, you said they've gone for the lowest bar. They've gone, they've gone for the lowest bar, but it does not give us any confidence whatsoever that they won't take out that particular. And for me, 
that, that not having that guarantee um, just makes this a potentially, I wouldn't be voting for this okay. sort of thing. They that's really should. That's and that's there's good. no reason why, I don't know, maybe I can ask Miriam this. If, when, when they're proposing to root the new sewer, surely they have drawings that shows where the current sewer is and their proposed route through it. That should be presented as evidence of what they intend to do and where they intend to go. I mean, we're giving them license for something, but we don't know what we're giving them license for. Mm. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Ooh, uh, sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, li like other members, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with the fact that they, they could, um, it, it seems there's nothing to stop them taking out the other hedgerows and this hedgerow. Um, I'm also not happy um, with the evidence that's, that, that, that's been supplied. Um, apologies if I'm going over something that, that's already been gone over. Um, but can I just ask for a little bit of further clarification on the um, limits, if any, to the discretion that we have under these regulations? Because I'm, I'm doing it in the meeting, I will admit, but I've had a quick look at the regulations and it looks like a kind of unconstrained discretion on the local planning authority to issue or not issue a hedge note, hedge, hedgerow retention notice. I'm, I'm sorry, I may be missing something, but I would like to just understand, you know, the, the constraints um, on us. I suppose it's, it, with, that's why it's before us, so it is within our discretion. We've just got to sort of provide the grounds for whatever our decision yeah, is. Yes, but yeah, but I suppose that's my point, is that I can't actually see anything specifying what those grounds um, could be, or in fact, I can't actually see anything saying that we need to specify any grounds. It just says that you can issue one or not issue one. I, I can't see anything in there myself saying there need, needs to be grounds. But, but that, we that's just why heard, like we, we did just hear from Miriam where she read out kind of what the test would be in a way, which is very low bar. Yes, I think Councillor um, Williams, you're correct that it's pretty broad discretion um, in these circumstances. So uh, just from what I've heard, um, members are agreeable. I, I was going to suggest that. Um, if we do choose to issue a hedgerow uh, retention. retention notice, um, that would be on the basis of a lack of information to justify the removal of such a large section of hedgerow and a consequent negative impact on the biodiversity of the local area. Um, and then that would be tested if they chose to appeal it or they could review their position and come back again with a better decision. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. That's fine. Good. Um, I think that's a... Councillor Harvey, if you're happy with what we've just heard there from Chris Carter, it's a reason why we would give to go to a vote now, which I think would be by affirmation to say that we issue a hedgerow retention order. Um, then we don't, do you still want to have a, a say? Yes, if I may. Oh, well, just clarification, um, can the retention order be lifted if Anglia will come back with a more reasonable approach? Okay. Miriam. Can a retention order be lifted if they come back with the... the I believe it can be. Um, I don't know what the process internally would be to consider that. I assume we would come back to planning committee. It, that's not really covered in our processes, but that would seem the reasonable approach. Yeah. And I, so I think this is... Members, you know, a very good test case in a way where you know we've seen something which is regulations lagging and uh, you know Anglia Water doing low bar because the regulations are lagging despite the fact that they have biodiversity strategies, we have biodiversity strategies, and we all know that we've got to take this all much much more seriously as the parish council so eloquently said as well. So um, let's take this to a vote. We've just heard the reasons why we would be issuing a hedgerow retention order. Um, but the vote would therefore be on the recommendation is that we do not issue a hedgerow retention notice and provide a no objection outcome. Do I take it by affirmation that we refuse that recommendation? <laughs> oh, that there's not a double negative then? <laughs> So can we make sure that we do we we do not that we refuse the recommendation by officers to not issue a hedgerow retention notice and provide a no objection outcome based on um, the justification given by Chris Carter? Thank you, everybody. Now it's five to one. Um, we have agenda items ten.
11 and 12, which are, um, and 13 are all TPOs. And then we have the enforcement report and the appeals um, notices. So we could have a lunch break or we could have a short break and come straight back in to deal with those items, which I think the latter is, is the better and we finish early. Agreed? So if we have a 10 minute break, and do please do get out. I do worry. <laughs> do get out. Make sure you get a breath of fresh air. So.
And welcome back, everybody, to South Kansas District Council Planning Committee. We've just had a short break before moving to agenda item 10 of our agenda pack. But before I do, I just want to return momentarily to agenda item 9 and clarify um, for records what our vote was, which is that we are voting, what we did was to vote to issue a hedgerow retention notice. Thank you. To avoid any doubt. <laughs> so now we'll move to agenda item 10, page 107 of our agenda pack. Um, this is in Fullbourne, 14 Doggett Lane. Fullbourne, the proposal is to serve a provisional tree preservation order at the request of another party. And the key material considerations, is it expedient in the interest of the community to make provision for the preservation of the trees or woodlands in their area? The recommendation is to serve a provisional tree protection order, preservation order. And the application is being brought to the committee because non-emergency TPOs must be brought to the committee for permission to serve provisional and confirmed orders. And the presenting officer, Miriam Hill, with us again. Miriam. Hello. Hello. Hello again. Good. Screen. Yes, we can. Thanks. Thank you. So there are two trees of interest, and they stand within the front garden of 14 Doggett's Lane. So Doggett's Lane, as you can see on this little location plan, is on the south side of Fullbourne and on a main road. The trees of interest are T1, a walnut, and T2, a beech tree. Both trees are mature and appear to be in reasonable health and vitality. They stand within the front garden of the property. Fullbourne is a well-treed village, and the village are passionate about their treescape, as demonstrated in the Fullbourne Village Design Guide. A key consideration is, is it expedient in the interest of the amenity to make provision for the preservation of trees or woodlands in the area? Amenity is not defined in law, and therefore it is left for local authorities to exercise their judgment. The trees must have a reasonable health and vitality and individual, collective or wider impact. Other factors may be considered, such as importance to nature conservation or responses to climate change, but only if the trees achieve the basic qualifying factors. The trees contribute positively to the street scene, and are hard to miss when traveling in either direction along Doggett Lane due to their stature and position within the front garden. Doggett's Lane is a busy Seathcast road and one of the main through village roads in Fullbourne. Therefore, the trees appear in the backdrop of many people's daily lives. The trees have no other significant cultural factors beyond ecosystem services provided by all large urban trees. But I would note that the beach is a copper beach and therefore has purple foliage during the summer months, making it pop in the landscape, arguably giving it more visual amenity, uh, its visual amenity more weight. The proposal is to serve a provisional TPO on those with an interest in the land and invite those parties an opportunity to submit objections, comments or representations. The responses will be considered and aid the decision to amend, confirm, or not confirm the order. Should the decision be taken to confirm the order, it will return to the planning committee to request that the order be confirmed. I recommend that the committee approves the issuing of a non-emergency provisional TPO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we have local member, Councillor Dr. Claire Dorn. Yes, thank you um, for allowing me to speak first. Um, I support this. Um, as uh, Miriam has pointed out, this is an important part of Fullbourne Village. It's the, um, it's the approach to um, the village, one of the main approach roads um, from uh, Borsham from the A11 and coming in the other direction from the city um, through Fullbourne. Um, and uh, she also points out Fullbourne is a well-treed village. Trees are very important to the village, to the residents, and um, are play an important part in the village design guide. Um, so I fully support uh, this provisional tree order. And, and as Miriam explains, it gives chance for uh, local people to have 
to comment on and, and to take views on the order. Thank you very much, members. Um, I would think we'd just go straight to the vote. And so the vote be on the recommendation that the committee approve the issuing of a non-emergency provisional TPO. By affirmation, thank you very much. Um, agenda item 11, page 111, the Tree Preservation Order 0008 from 1989 on New Road, Hazling Field, and the proposal is to revoke a tree preservation order which is no longer current. The recommendation is to revoke the order and the application brought to the committee because it's required under the council scheme of delegation. Miriam. Hello again. Hello. So Miriam, as I understand it, this, you explained it to us in the last planning committee. You're going, you're sort of doing a thorough sort of review and audit of, of all of the orders and, and where those that have, um, yeah, that's what you're doing, sort of a clean out at the moment. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Um, a, a, a sort of re comprehensive review has not been undertaken for about, well, ever, but um, certain parishes have been had a review over the years. These tend to have been the more urban areas, so the smaller villages sometimes haven't had their TPOs reviewed. So at the moment, yes, we're just going through and seeing if they're fit for purpose and also if they're actually not necessary anymore because the trees have gone for whatever reason. Good, so this is helping us do an audit of where we are with our trees at the same time. So thank you very much. Do you want to just give us a yeah, summary of this one? Yes, so... Um, this tree, this, uh, you can see here, here we are in Hasling Field on one of the main roads. This TPO is from 1989. The tree was felled in 2002 with permission, granted on the 25th of June 2002. Uh, the tree was a sycamore and it was in decline and become structurally unsafe. There are no outstanding conditions or other items or etc so that i recommend that we prove to revoke the order so thank you can i just ask why you know if it was with permission why didn't it get revoked at that time or was that just part of the things we're clearing up right now um what tends to happen is you the permissions generally last two years even though the tree was in a dangerous condition it wouldn't necessarily mean that it would come out immediately okay. and um, historically, you would probably do the revoking sort of once a year, um, but it's kind of that function, that process that will get missed if you're, it's very busy in the office. Um, and I would say in, before computerization, it was a lot more tricky job. So this is why we're trying to sort of sort out some of these processes now and hopefully going forward will be a little bit um, more set up through computerization that we can clean these up as we go along. Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, members? You know what you're going to? Yep, so the, <laughs> so the recommendation is on page 112 that we approve the revocation of the TPO. Thank you very much. Agenda item 12, which is TPO 0006 from 1983, 44 High Street, Coton. Um, the proposal is to revoke a tree preservation order which is no longer current, the recommendation to revoke the order, um, and the application again brought to the committee because it's required under the council's scheme of delegation. Miriam. This is an ash tree. Um, yes. So the tree in question was removed in 1984 uh, with approval. Oh, sorry, bear with me. There we go. Um, with approval on appeal to the Departments of the Environment and Transport, dated 30th of July, 1984. There are no outstanding conditions, et cetera, which would need to be discharged. Um, committee, so do we, by affirmation, recommend that this is revoked? Good, thank you. And we go now to agenda item 13, TPO 0019 from 1989. 17 Woodhall Lane, Bolsham. Um, the proposal is to revoke a TPO, which is no longer current. Recommendation to revoke the order. Miriam. Yes. 
Um, there is no tree present on the 2003 aerial photography. South Cairns District Council does, not, does have some historical records in relation to this TPO, um, but nothing which refers to the removal of the tree. The tree was still present in 1990 and is mentioned in planning application, building planning applications. It is not known when this tree was removed or why. Due to the amount of time which has elapsed since the tree's loss, no further inquiries have been made. So the tree has been lost at some point between 1990 and 2003. The cold case. Cold so, case, yes. Cold case, yeah. So um, committee do by affirmation? No, Councillor Dr. Jean Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, in cases like this where there is no record of permission to fell the tree, I know, you know it's been a while, but surely there, we can still trace who done it. And is there any, uh, what are the consequences of somebody doing something like this, taking the tree down without permission? So we did, I think we did mention this at the last committee meeting, didn't we? Which is what we want to do is make sure that we are not encouraging this, that, you know, because you just revoke the TPO once it's been removed. But we also discussed the fact when something is so historic, you know, is, is that the right use of, you know, officer time to go back and do the whodunit on that one? Um, what we're doing now is, is cleaning, but I'll, Miriam, do you think that there is, you know, both the, the possibility of finding out who done it and a good use of your time to find out who done it if it's this historic a case? I think it would be very difficult to identify who took the tree out unless there was some local knowledge and even then someone might deny it. There's a kind of a limitation on the enforcement process to three years, so we, it would have had to have been undertaken in the last three years. So, we're, as it wasn't on the 2003 aerial photography, there was no chance of, you know, take, taking this forward or inquiring why that was. So I think what we what we do, and again, Miriam, this is very supportive of the work that, that you do with your, your team, but what we want to do is be able to you know, in, encourage enforcement within the time that there is of that three years time. You know, now, you know, we want to make sure that we're not encouraging the practice that something gets cut down prior to permission being given or something like that, or whatever nefarious reasons. I think you referred to nefarious reasons in our last planning committee. So I've Dr. Richard Williams. Oh, thank you. I think Heather Williams wants to speak before you. Uh, uh, okay, I'll go quickly. Um, just, just, just two points. Um, one on, on, on the whodunit question. Um, I, this is a general query, maybe rather than one specific to this case, but um, could we not just look at the land ownership records? And if the land is in the same ownership uh, now, uh, continuously since 1990, um, you know, maybe we could do something there. Um, and then secondly, just a point of clarification, really, for the future as much as anything. So is it three years from it happening or three years from us finding out and if it's three years from us finding out is it the case then I take it that those aerial photographies are deemed to be us knowing that, 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 that it's gone because if it's three years from us finding out that the tree's gone then then if we've only recently found out and that you know Miriam photograph doesn't count we, we could still do something Miriam yes to, yeah to the three years is from it happening we actually have a very, very short time period of about six months from when we become aware of it. So it is an even tighter time frame than the three years. So um, I also take a little bit of, um, with the new environment bill, what I understand in terms of the, we've been given in one of our briefings on the biodiversity net gain is that everybody should know that the baseline is from when the environment bill was presented to parliament. It's not from when it's approved finally as a bill. So everything that already exists, you know, that is the baseline. It's not from when the bill is, is finally presented. So, you know, and, and you will have, so everybody would be, would have to make up for anything that they removed at the moment. But what we have to do is be vigilant and make sure that, you know, everybody is looking out for, the, the trees and hedgerows and biodiversity that's there. And we've just got to make sure that you've got enough 
and resources as well, Miriam, to be able to do your, your job. But I think probably we're better served to be looking at the cases that we can follow up you know, within the statutory limitations you know, around now rather than some of the historical ones. Um, but we've taken point of that note and Councillor Heddle will be next. I was just going to say that I think we're all, all dissatisfied with the situation where somebody has obviously removed a tree and not let us know and it was had a, t a TPO. Um, I think one of the things that's referenced about the, when does the sort of countdown for three years start, which um, Councillor Richard Williams has, has identified and has been addressed. Um, I would also say that it's a 13, potentially 13 year period. Um, potentially people won't even still be alive because when you look back, I mean, I was two. So it, I think, I think that it's frustrating. I think that we should definitely be acting on the future, but I think we would potentially struggle unless, of course, it is one, one family. So I think we could do an initial check as, as is recommended, but trying to match it back would potentially be quite difficult. So, yeah, and, and members, what I think is to do is re recognize the huge effort that's been undertaken right now to get us in a situation where we have a proper understanding and audit of what we've got in the digitalized process to make this absolutely possible and i would recommend we don't do it you know any kind of who done it research on this particular case and that we move to the vote would you like to speak to paul quickly yes um we can move to it's, it's just exploring what our options were really um to to hopefully act as a deterrent um, going further but um yes just to say thank you to miriam for the work that she's doing obviously now that we have a new uh, planning software that we can use to record stuff like this. We're now catching up on lots of things that have been missed um, over time. So, yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. So, members, I'm going to take us straight to the vote, um, and that is that we recommend approval of the revocation of this TPO. By affirmation, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much, Miriam, for that section. Um, we move to agenda item 14, which is the enforcement report. Hello, Will. Hello, good afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon. Um, is it? Uh, yes, it is. Gosh. So, yes. Will, thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have anything that you'd like to um, highlight for us? Yes, it was just interesting with the ch discussion about TPO trees. Um, so I thought I'd just come in on them with that to clarify from an enforcement perspective of what we can do but what uh -huh. we can't do. Good. Um, it is correct that it is three years from destruction of the tree. Um, and we do have six months to act from when we become aware of the removal of the tree before we have to lay summons at court. If we don't lay summons within that time limit, we cannot take any further action on it. Okay. Um, obviously, we are restricted in staffing. Um, and obviously, there are a number of TPO trees, so we are a complete lead um, on removal of trees. One thing that we are looking at doing... Uh, very shortly is sending tree surgeons um, that we use a link to all of our mapping portals so that they can check for themselves um, whether the trees are either TPO'd or within a conservation area so that they should be aware that they do need consent as a reminder. That's very good, thank you. Um, and then just a couple of verbal updates uh, on the Crowdate site at Linton. A uh, meeting was held by Stephen Kelly and several other people at the site on the 4th of August, um, where discussions are continuing uh, with the flood um, and drainage matters. Enforcement are still being copied into everything, so we are ready to take action should we be required at any point, uh, once we are formally instructed. Um, and then another case I'm going to be adding on to the next committee is Cottage Nursery Cardinals Green in Horseheath. Um, a current update at the moment for that is we're trying to arrange a joint site visit uh, due to numerous complications at the site uh, to various departments in the local authority. And that's the enforcement update. That's good. Any, uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Well, yes, Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. 
Uh, thank you, Jeff. Through you, a couple of things. If I can just step back on the uh, TPO issue. Um, I wonder if, I mean, you mentioned the three, three surgeons being able to have uh, access to the information. Um, what about when uh, properties change hands? Does, is there a way of indicating to when the search is done that there's a TPO on a tree within the curtilage of that property? Because that yeah, will sorry. alert the new owners, because sometimes owners don't know that there's a TPO on the tree. Yeah, so I think it varies. Obviously, when, when people buy properties, they are aware of the restrictions on their properties. Whether they read that or not is a matter for themselves. But obviously, a TPO or within a conservation area is flagged up in the local searches when people are buying properties. So they are aware of that. But only in conservation areas, not in other areas. But, well, you don't need planning permission obviously for conservation areas, or if there is a direct TPO ah, okay. on that property. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, second thing is, what's happening with Burwash Manor? I mean, this was the same statement we had in the, la in the, in the last report. Yes. It's like it's just yeah. at a standstill. It's not at a standstill. I know it is moving. I spoke to John Chuggerwood yesterday. Um, he's got a number of prosecutions that he's going through at the moment that we are trying to, to get through, and uh, I have impressed upon him to prioritise it uh, where I can. Um, so, yeah, apologies, but it is in hand. Thank you, Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, through yourself, Chair, just on the uh, Whitehall Farm House in Arrington, it's, um, there were some issues that I know the applicant had in, in submitting their application. Do we, do we know how long it's going to take to validate it? Because that's been going on quite some time. And the other, I, I do feel since um, since the sort of changes in May, we no longer have Councillor McWright on planning committee. So I feel duty bound to say Smith and Fenn, um, we haven't had a report on that for a significant amount of time. It used to be a standing item that we got updated on. Um, what What's going on with that? Thank you. Okay, so. I'll, I'll go to Smithy Fenn first. Obviously, we have instructed uh, an outside company to carry out a review of all the enforcement matters with the site. Um, we are currently waiting out for review um, so that we can consider what actions we will be taking. And I am aware that that will be made available to members once we have it. On Smithy Fenn's site. On, sorry, Councillor, the other site. So, just before you go on to the other site, which is the Arrington site. I was just say, obviously, so that's still an outstanding issue that the, we really do need to keep keeping up to date. So, like Burwash Manor Farm is on there regularly, I would suggest that we have Smithy, Smithy Fen back on there, please. And the other one was about it says in here about planning applications and submitted, um, but not yet validated. Do we have any update on that? Because obviously, this is. You know, it's taken us a long time to just get the application in. Thank you, Councillor. I'll chase some of the planning officers to see what we need to overcome to get the application validated. I'll update you as soon as possible on that one. Uh, and I will get Smithy Fenn added for the next planning committee for you. Thank you thank very you. much. Councillor Tony Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, I'm not sure when this was put together, but as far as I know, the validation will be very short these days. Less than a week. It, that's correct, Councillor Hawkins. It, it might be that the application is invalid rather than waiting to be validated, in which case it might be that further information will be passed on the applicant, but I'm sure Mr Holloway can check that or ask someone to check that for us and then report back. Thank you. Councillor Patrick Jones. Thank you very much. Um, my question actually relates to the um, the overall picture from the numbers in Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. Um, I just wanted to ask, does the um, Enforcement Department keep a record of cases where informal um, action is taken? Um, and if so, could um, that information be provided to the committee. My, my reasoning being here is we get a record of the formal actions of which there are, you know, a number, but not, not that many. And when you look at the number of actual reports, it, it, it's huge. And I'm just wondering if something is happening in the middle there that we're not quite capturing um, 
and whether we could get some information on that. Yes, Councillor, it, it was something that obviously I have mentioned previously, that if there are any more information points that you want me to produce, then I'm more than happy to be able to do that. As you correctly say, we do have um, remedial cases where things are resolved without any need for formal enforcement action, which are good results from our officers. Um, and like I say, minor resolutions, and also when we decide something is not expedient as well. Um, that might also be something that you wish to have put forward. Uh, more than happy for you to email me to detail what you want to be added, or if any of the councillors would, uh, and then I can look to amend it accordingly. Thank you. That's very helpful. I'll do that. Good. Thank you very much, Councillor Batchelor. Yeah, thank you. I'm referring to Appendix 2 again regarding the notices served uh, in June 21. I'm actually looking at the stop notice part of that. It says there have been zero served year to date in 2021 albeit in the report there was one served on the Crowder site in Linton. So I think just wanted to make sure that that hadn't been missed or if that number should be one at a minimum. Was it a temporary stop notice? Yeah, it, it was a temporary stop Oh no, notice. sorry, you're right. I should have read properly. My apologies. <laughs> no, it's not going to count. I can keep what's what in this. <laughs> so that's one to you, Will. That's all right. <laughs> I'm taking that one. You're ahead. You're ahead. See you next time. Good, thank you very much, Will. And so um, we now move to agenda item 15, um, appeals. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just one that I think members may well have already spotted themselves, but uh, land northeast of Rampton Road, Tottenham, which was recommended for approval by officers and refused by the committee, has been dismissed at appeal. Um, the reasons for the appeal being dismissed focus on um, the uh, size of the buildings being um, out of keeping uh, with the local area significantly out of scale, also impacts on the key vista, the view towards All Saints Church. Um, so that's just one for noting, but no other comments to make, Chair. Happy to try and answer any questions. Well, yes, I think that would be in, just important to perhaps understand that a bit more. Um, Chris, does anybody have any questions about that? So, just a clarification. Um, was that the plan, uh, the application where there would be a neighbourhood plan that we relied upon um, with a potential view? I think that's actually very helpful to know that, that that's the plan that's been upheld by the authority. Yes, it was. Um, I'll circulate the appeal decision if that's helpful. Um, I thought that had already happened, but perhaps not, so I'll do that. No, so I think that's that's good good news, isn't it? Very, very good news. Thank you. Councillor Halloween. Thank you. My um, question is on relation to page 131. Um, 18th October is the provisional date given. Are we are we pretty sure every piece of paper that needs to go out has gone out on that, um, whether it's from us or them, obviously, because that seems to have been holding things up. And the other one is I did ask last time, but to my knowledge, I've not had a re response, about um, land at and to the rear of 1332, which I believe you were updated on, and there's potential challenges around, it's on non-determination that they've, um, will we be essentially giving the view of what we would have done had we done it in time? We've done that previously before something's gone to informal hearing, so then at least, you know, whoever's looking at it knows whether we would have approved it or not. Um, I do think that's quite, quite important on those non-determination cases. To you, Chair. Yes, that's correct. We will be um, setting out those views in, as part of that appeal. I've uh, spoke to the case officer about that after the last meeting. Apologies if I didn't update you on that. Um, with regard to Mill Lane Sawston, yes, the obviously we had a hearing date which was agreed, but uh, then had to be delayed because the applicant hadn't uh, displayed a site notice. Uh, that wasn't the council's doing. Um, as far as I'm aware, those provisional dates are still provisional um, unless Mr. Reid has more up-to-date information. Um, unfortunately, the date of that provisional, the chamber is booked, so we're seeing if another venue can be found or whether it has to be rearranged yet again. I'll feed back to the case officer the concern that a thorough check is made that all paperwork is in order for the appeal. So... When you say, my understanding is the formal hearings have sometimes been here at the council, so are you referring to our chamber? 
in which case, I don't know what is currently booked for that day, but given that we've been waiting for this for an extremely long time, perhaps um, as chair of the planning committee, chair, you could write to whoever, whatever chair is on that meeting explaining the situation and maybe our chamber could become available. For council. I'm happy to have a discussion to move for council if that actually, you know, when was this first done? I don't know. It was scheduled for May, I think, originally, the, but the appeals have been there for quite some time, that's correct. I, I understand it wasn't our, our fault, but I'm, I'm just saying it's a case that we really need to come to some form of conclusion. I'm not sure what it's doing today, I'm sorry. Um, I, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm happy to speak with others about making sure we have some facility here for it to go ahead um, if needed, or can we hire somewhere else? Because I just think it's important that we rip this plaster off, really. Through you, Chair, I think um, we note the point and take it back and uh, discuss with the team that's working on it as to whether you know, having it in the final alternative venue, because I think an alternative venue on the same day is obviously the preferred outcome. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to find that out first and then perhaps come back with a point of order. But obviously, Chair's decision is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll support it. So if you can let us know if that's possible, we should at least explore it. Good. Um, and then what I'd just like to end of that agenda item is um, the request of Chris Carter is to add an update, Chris, on things that we, we were expecting to come back in terms of updates. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just very briefly, um, just to be noted that uh, for Waterbeach Newtown East, that was the ROW application, and for Bourne Airfield, um, the resolution of the committee in both cases required an update report to be brought back on the Section 106 negotiations. Um, one of those was due this month. I can confirm that they'll both be coming next month in September. Um, I'm pleased to say that negotiations have gone well in both cases and we're moving towards completion of Section 106 agreements, but um, just because that was a requirement of those resolutions, just wanted to let the committee know that they would be coming in September for your, for your understanding. Thank you. Yes? Just the 18th of October isn't for council. I don't, don't, we're not going to sort it here. I don't think we've got the agenda. But what we'll do is we've, we've noted this. This is a previous point. So we've noted that for some reason the, the, they will check what's happening with this room and explore if there's a possibility to hold through here. So, but on this, which is the announcement of the Section 106, it's really, really important. I, I want to make sure that when we do ask for things to come back, you know, they do come back. It's really good to know that the negotiations are going well. And it's fine that this comes back to us in September, because what we want is a good, a good result coming back to us. Thank you. Councillor Hagel, you understand? Thank you, Chairman. Just, just on the um, one sort of any other business, is the planning advisory, I'm sorry, we originally were the implementation group, I've forgotten what it's called now, I think it's the CAS group. Obviously, we've not met for some time now, I think it was February, um, and then the meeting had to be cancelled most recently. Um, do we have any dates? I'll, I'll take that often, away and find the date, yes. Because, it, you know, we're going to be at six months soon. Yeah, no, and I'll go back. And I think what happened on the last one was not enough people were available for the dates being put forward, and that's why it was cancelled. But I will make sure that we have a schedule of the next meetings. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, thank you, everybody. It's quarter to two. Um, and I think we have a record in that all of... The decisions were by affirmation. There was agreement in the room um, and good debate. So thank you, everybody.